Hello everyone, it's Kelly Beatty coming to you live from the Chelmsford Senior Center, the Chelmsford Senior Center for the Spring Annual Town Meeting Session. And you know, everyone has gathered here for the first time in roughly a year and a half uh, due to COVID complications. The, the state of emergency has been lifted. The This meeting is usually taking place in April, but it was not a good time in April, and, and really all we need to do is, is to meet before the 1st of July when the next fiscal year begins. And so, we have a pretty full docket tonight, but I have to say, having all of the town meeting reps here back at their old stomping grounds, as opposed to the high school gymnasium, is uh, refreshing, a little bit like it used to be, something of a festive atmosphere a little bit, a lot of people glad to see each other, as we are glad to see you and having you here with us this evening. This. This town meeting warrant is, uh, on face value, very formidable. There are 42 town meeting warrant articles for the regular session and another five for the special town meeting that will commence uh, on, on Monday night. But there are a couple of ameliorating circumstances. One is that uh, three of the, of the articles, four of them actually, have been withdrawn. Also, there is a new wrinkle that we've been using the last couple of years called the consent agenda. And for this particular town meeting, 15 of the articles on this warrant are being combined into one vote. That will certainly speed things up. The uh, town manager, Paul Cohen, is uh, really hoping that we'll get this done in two nights, that is tonight and Monday night. Uh, but if it goes three nights, uh, it wouldn't be uh, too much of a surprise. Uh, that special town meeting will take place on Monday night, as I mentioned. Now, this will be the meeting at which these representatives will approve the budget for the coming fiscal year. And uh, that in encompasses uh, $65 million for the school department, which they will uh, uh, spend as they choose. It's sort of a bottom line figure. And then the school department will decide how that money gets distributed. And then for the regular uh, rest of the town, the police, fire, administration, and so forth, $68.1 million. The school department budget represents a 5.4% increase over the previous year, and the town's uh, general budget, 3.4%. Now, you've probably heard about the, uh, the, the American, um, I'm sorry, the, the, uh, the funding from the federal government that has gone out to all the cities and, and towns. Uh, and, and in fact, Chelmsford stands to get about $11 million of that money. But none of that is included in this year's budget. For one thing, that will re represent a one-time payment. It's not something that we'll have every year. And the other thing is that we really don't, just spoke with uh, town accountant uh, uh, John Souza, uh, finance director, we don't know when those monies will come. Uh, it's interesting that here in Massachusetts, because we have a very weak county system, some of the money that would have otherwise been apportioned to counties, uh, which is a stronger form of government in other states, will get divvied up among the towns themselves. So expect to hear something about that right off the beginning when uh, uh, John Sousa and the town manager, Paul Cohen, will discuss the, 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 uh, the general state of the, uh, of the town and, and where things are going. But we do have a pretty full docket. As I look down it, I don't see a lot of things that are particularly contentious until we get to the very end, Articles 39, 38, 39, and 40, which have to do with amending the bylaws to allow for uh, more flexible uh, uh, accommodation of marijuana dispensaries, marijuana ownership, and I anticipate that that will be sort of the, the flashpoint for long debate and we probably won't get to that until until uh, Monday night at the earliest. But in the meantime, I want to let you know that uh, we're back here at the Senior Center. Things are starting to get back to normal. We're here on uh, June 17th, and that's not far from July 4th. Our recovery from the pandemic came a little too late for the town to embrace uh, wholeheartedly the usual 4th of July festivities. There will be a parade, a smaller than usual parade. There won't be any of the uh, bands from out of state or from Canada like we're used to seeing. There won't be the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, country fair that the uh, Lions Club usually puts on, nor the art. I don't think there will be an art exhibit. Maybe I'll, I'll have to check on that. I'll have that for you on Monday night. 
But in the meantime, please do come down to, uh, uh, there, there will be no John Carson Road Race for sure. So please come down and uh, cheer on our, your uh, fellow townspeople on the 4th of July and t just take that one more step into normalcy. Now here, by the way, uh, at the uh, uh, annual town meeting, uh, masks are not required for those who have been fully vaccinated. Obviously, it's optional at their part. Uh, masks are required for those who are not vaccinated. I don't see anybody checking anything, so uh, it's a, probably an honor system thing. You might have also noticed that we're starting a little bit late. We usually start at 7.30, and John Curlin up there at the, uh, at the front uh, is calling the, the meeting to order and the Pledge of Allegiance. We're starting 15 minutes late because when the paperwork was filed for this town meeting, it was going to take place at the high school gymnasium at 7.30. And so literally what town moderator John Curlin has done, he has shown up there, called the meeting to order, and immediately re uh, adjourned it until 15 minutes later here at the senior center, which is the sort of um, legal maneuvering that had to be done in order to return to the senior center for, for our usual festivities. Again, the first few articles that you will hear after the, the uh, sort of state of the town, uh, the, the, the reports of town officers and committees, will be the, uh, the first three will be funding for the Neshoba Valley Technical School, uh, funding for the school department, public, Chelmsford Public Schools, funding for our uh, general government operating budget, and then uh, uh, Article 8 is the uh, capital budget for $3.8 million. So those are the big ticket items. Honestly, I don't think there will be much debate about those at all. There's been no contention that I've heard in, uh, coming from the Finance Committee or the School Department or the town for that matter. There's no money being withdrawn from the Stabilization Fund, our rainy day fund, to balance the budget has been, as has been the case for the last couple of years. So honestly, I expect the, uh, the budgetary part to go pretty smoothly, unlike, uh, say, 10 years ago when it, it took a whole evening all by itself as it was picked through line by line. I think that says something for our, our collective confidence in the, the town manager, uh, his staff, the uh, finance committee, the school department that uh, since when everyone is, is pulling in the same direction, it goes a lot faster. Here's John Curley. I'd like to call town meeting to order. Will you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, at this point, I'm going to uh, turn the meeting over to the town clerk who's going to swear in the new town meeting reps. Good evening. Can I have every newly elected town meeting rep or re-elected as of the April election please stand? Thank you. If you could all please raise your right hands and repeat after me. I state your name. Do solemnly swear and affirm that I will faithfully and impartially discharge and perform all the duties incumbent upon me as a town meeting representative according to the bylaws and charter of the town of Chelmsford the laws of the Commonwealth, and the Constitution of the United States. Congratulations, you're duly sworn. Thank you. Congratulations to all of you. At this point, we're going to test our voting, uh, our new clickers. I understand we have new clickers that uh, indicate yes, no, and abstain. Uh, so. Uh, We'll, we'll do a quorum test and uh, make sure that your clicker does uh, reflect uh, your vote when you see your name. While we're doing that, it is my understanding that there um, may be some people here for uh, Articles 38 and 39. Um, 
We are not going to be reaching those this evening. Uh, and if anybody in the planning board disagrees with my, the understanding I have is that the planning board is going to have uh, some meetings uh, before the next session uh, to review some amendments that have been submitted. So uh, if you're here for those articles and only those articles, I don't want you to spend the all evening here and then be upset with me that we didn't get to 38 or 39. Okay, uh, we do have a quorum, 115 uh, plus 8 plus 1, whatever that adds up to. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the the uh, fire exits, we have two on each side and one uh, in the hallway when you come in. I have been asked to request that if you have to leave the meeting early, climb, uh, kindly drop off your electronic voting devices with the checkers if, when you leave early. I would like to welcome all town meeting reps to tonight's meeting. It is certainly great to be back at the Senior Center. It's hard to believe that it's, it's been over 200 days since we, uh, we last met here. And to me, the Senior Center is home to town meeting. As has been our practice, we have two screens so that all reps may read the articles and any amendments upon which you may be voting. Speaking of amendments, all amendments will be submitted on the forms which you can get from either the town clerk or me. This form will create an original in three copies. I retain the white copy. The yellow copy goes to the amendment assistant, the pink copy to the town clerk, and you retain the orange copy. Here are the rules with respect to town meeting protocol and procedure. All questions and debate shall emanate from the microphone facing the moderator at the center aisle and shall go through the moderator. Board or committee members, other town officials or department heads may use other microphones to answer questions or provide information to the meeting. Speakers shall refrain from asking rhetorical or argumentative questions and shall only ask questions seeking needed information. The questions should be in the who, what, when, where, and why mode. Kindly avo avoid argumentative questions that start with, isn't it true? or wouldn't you admit? I would prefer not to have to rule questions out of order, but I am bound by the laws and regulations that define our conduct, and I will do my best to enforce them fairly and respectfully. I will allow a reasonable amount of time for follow-up questions, but I will have to intervene if any individual is asking an excessive number of follow-up questions. While I would prefer that all presenters of articles be limited to five minutes, uh, tonight, if there is, uh, if, if there is a, a, if there's any that require more time, I will grant those additional minutes in my discretion and I will notify uh, each presenter when they have one minute remaining. With respect to uh, discussion, speakers are encouraged to be brief and each speaker will be limited to three minutes of debate. You should be able to make your points within three minutes if you truly believe that that is not enough time for you to make your arguments, kindly advise me in advance and I may allow some leeway. Speakers should ask their questions prior to engaging in discussion. Making your inquiries will not be considered part of the three minute discussion limit unless you have started discussion and then ask questions. Once the clock starts, it will not stop until the speaker does or time expires. I would appreciate being advised at the time that a speaker is be beginning discussion. We do have some other rules of protocol. Please do not refer to any prior speaker by name. The proper designation is to call him or her the previous speaker. Please refrain from personal attacks. Challenging or arguing in opposition to another's position is fair game and is what this meeting is all about. Intentional slander against any individual or group cannot be tolerated. Let us refrain from repeating arguments that have already been made, but new ideas or distinctions are welcome and encouraged. Discussion of pending litigation will not be permitted unless specifically included in the Warren article being debated. If during the, the course of discussion, I observe several speakers on one side of an issue, but none in opposition, I will interrupt debate to inquire if there are any who wish to express the opposing position or offer an amendment. If there are none, 
I shall end debate and move the question. If there is opposition, I will move that party to the front of the line and allow debate to continue. I trust that you will all appreciate how this will advance the mutual goal of moving town meeting along. To those of you who may be next in line, should I ever have to exercise this process, you have my apologies in advance. There will not be any debating from the presenter's podium. They may answer questions, but should they want to engage in debate, presenters will have to queue up in line like everyone else. A person should not speak a second time until everyone has had an opportunity to speak unless a, the previous speaker wishes to correct or dispute a statement of fact made by another speaker. This privilege will be narrowly construed by the moderator. Transparency and effective governance are the two goals of town meeting. To expedite our meetings without affecting transparency, we have su successfully employed a process called consent agenda. A consent agenda allows the representatives to bundle several routine warrant articles into, uh, into one. So that instead of taking several separate votes on these essentially bookkeeping articles, we take one vote on all of them. The town manager and I have discussed the type of articles that would be conducive to this process. These are articles that generally do not any, involve any questions or debate and are passed in the normal course of town business. I shall request a motion that the body vote to approve the consent agenda involving the articles to be included in the consent agenda. This still allows for questions and answers and discussion with the opportunity to add or delete um, consent agenda articles as town meeting deems best. The articles that I am suggesting for a consent agenda are articles 3, 7, 9, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 29, 30, 36, and 42. We shall meet on Monday, June 21st at 7.30 to commence a special town meeting and shall resume our regular town meeting once we have completed the special town meeting agenda. Also, there are two citizen petition articles, numbers 28 and 32, and I respectfully request that you take these two matters out of order so that they are uh, the first two articles heard on Thursday, June 24th for the benefit of citizens and communities concerned. Finally, I will be recusing myself during Article 32 since I have a conflict of interest, and next Thursday you will be asked to approve a temporary monitor for that article only. Thank you. At this time, I will uh, turn the, the meeting over to the town manager. Good evening, Mr. Moderator. Good evening, town meeting representatives. Um, I'm Paul Cohen, town manager, and um, it's an honor to be here before you this evening. And um, as John noted, we have a large warrant with 42 articles, as well as a five, hour, a five article special town meeting warrant. So I, myself, the administrative staff, and boards and committees will do the best we can to provide our information as efficiently as possible. Uh, and obviously, uh, welcome to answer any questions and concerns that you have to help you make an informed decision. The first article is customary for uh, annual town meetings, is to hear reports of the town officers and committees. And as I mentioned, given the, the length and duration of the warrant and the time of the year, um, we've sort of streamlined this article to um, just give you an overview of the town meeting. But, but first, I really wanted to take an opportunity under this reports article to recognize the extraordinary efforts of our first responders, health officials, and other town employees and officials during this past year. And Thank you. As you know, it's been an extraordinary time, and we hope it's, it's for us, only a once-in-a-lifetime experience uh, dealing with the pandemic. But one can't help admire uh, in, in the, the efforts and accomplishments that, that have bring us to where we are today in a, in a facility uh, together. Um, and and it, it really should be noted the efforts that we saw from our school employees, school committee, 
you know, the, the efforts in terms of educating students in an, in an unprecedented time with remote learning, hybrid learning, uh, and then ultimately in-school learning. And so again, the dedicated commit school committee, uh, school uh, teachers and paraprofessionals, and all the other support employees should be noted, as well as the facilities department who undertook the efforts working with the school's facility and custodial personnel to provide a safe and healthy environment for our children in the facilities, as well as the overall efforts um, for example, in the town library um, by our, our dedicated li and longstanding library director, Becky Herman, and the library staff, it's, it, it certainly is noted that our library was, you know, has provided the outstanding service, whether it was curbside, and, and clearly they, they offered and still offered the, the most hours and, and opportunities uh, during the pandemic, as well as the efforts, again, across the town from our town offices who came in with, with pandemic conditions, again, noting the police, the fire, the uh, everybody, you know, cemetery workers and so forth. So again, thank you on, on everyone's behalf. And, and again, it, it, it's an unprecedented time. And again, you'll see us in the future as we move away from the pandemic to, to work with the select board and other, and other committees uh, and how to utilize the um, American Rescue Plan Act monies that are available to the community to address the ongoing challenges from COVID, as well as issues of equity and other allowances under the federal and state money. So uh, again, thank you for an effort so, so achieved so far, and we welcome the efforts in the future uh, going forward as the, the coordinated team and, and group of volunteers and professionals uh, em employees that we have. Um, so moving on to the report, just to, as I said, a financial overview. Um, as I noted, we, we really have weathered through everything with, with all the efforts from the pandemic. Um, the good news is in terms of financially is in, in working with our town accountant and finance director, they recently reported to the select board and the finance committee that we will close out this fiscal year in the black with a cash surplus. Um, and, and again, if you had asked us you know, 16, 18 months ago, prior to the commencement of the pandemic, what was ahead of us and how we would come through this. I, I think we're all sort of amazed on, on how we have come through this. And again, it was not without the efforts internally to the community, but also the support from the state and federal government financially. The budget that we're presenting to you this evening through Neshoba Tech, um, through the Chelmsford Public Schools and, and through the general government is $144.5 million operating budget we have a $3.9 million capital plan and other financial warrant articles. And, and as you consider these materials, it's notable to note that this budget was prepared back in January in the midst of the pandemic, uh, working with the select board, school committee, finance committee, town boards and committees and town employees. We basically assembled a level service, level staffing budget because we really didn't know what was ahead of us in terms of the challenges and the, the, the revenue constraints and, and, and what, what for it. So you will see and you'll hear from the presenters that essentially it's a, a, a steady as you go budget uh, really without any major new initiatives. Um, and then as I noted, when we finish the year in the black, we'll come back here in October at fall town meeting and decide knowing then how we close the fiscal year, what portion of the town monies uh, to apply to, uh, from our free cash to address the increase in the property tax levy. Because you may recall, when we approved the budget for the year that we're finishing up this month, we utilized a $2 million um, transfusion from our stabilization fund to provide fiscal relief during that period. And we really want to moderate our way out of it to avoid you know, uh, sharp increases in the tax levy. And then finally, as I noted earlier, uh, we, we are looking towards the um, real federal monies, uh, the, Town Finance Director noted to me today that we have received in, the, in our accounts the first um, deposit of those monies, and again, we'll move forward. So now moving on uh, to the consent agenda, Mr. Moderator, that's the end of my presentation for Article 1. Thank you. So uh, at this time, um, I will entertain a motion to um, approve uh, the fact that we will include these 15 articles in the consent agenda. Uh, do I hear a motion? Uh, second? Okay. Uh, is there any discussion? Is 
Pledge not precinct 73. These articles are indicated as having no action. Should they be removed from the agenda? No, that's why they're in the consent agenda, so that we can just get rid of them. So we're voting on something that says it has no action? Right. Okay. Anything else? All right. There being uh, no further discussion, uh, all in favor of uh, considering these 15 articles as part of a consent agenda, please vote in the affirmative, and then we will actually get to uh, the meat of the consent agenda after we have a vote, assuming it passes. So this concept of a consent agenda is a fairly recent innovation uh, that John, moderator John Curlin has introduced. It certainly provides a rapid way to get rid of what we've come to call housekeeping articles, articles that appear year after year. Uh, a lot of them involve um, what are called enterprise funds. It used to be called revolving accounts. Uh, kind of like a bank account within the within the town departments. Uh, for example, uh, Chelmsford Telemedia uh, is is its funding is handled through an enterprise fund, which is one of these consent agendas, and uh, it basically says that, that money that the we motion get passes will go into uh, with it and a vote of 131 in favor, it. two opposed, and two abstentions. So, Mr. Manager. Okay. If you wish to address the <clears throat> Okay, thank articles. you, Mr. Moderator. I'll go through these in, in numerical order, obviously, and uh, please bear with me. We will have to, since they're not numerically in sequence, we'll have to flip through the presentation a little bit. The first article is Article 3, um, and there is no action under that. That was a placeholder that we placed on the warrant for collective bargaining agreements. We have none to present to you this evening. At this point in time, we have two uh, groups that are out without a contract at this point, um, the dispatchers union and the police superior officers union, and perhaps we'll have an opportunity at fall town meeting to consider those two items. The next article under the consent agenda uh, is, <coughs> moves on to article seven. Article 7 is the Finance Committee Reserve Fund. And again, where this is a, a, an annual article and, and it, again, ministerial business, we're, we're requesting once again a level funded amount of $400,000 to be used as a reserve fund uh, at the discretion of the Finance Committee for the upcoming fiscal year in accordance with state law. And again, these monies are available in, in Chelmsford for two purposes. Outside of town meeting, the Finance Committee can, can transfer monies from this fund to provide funding for extraordinary or unforeseen expenditures, and also within town meeting, it is a funding source to cover uh, un unforeseen issues that arise during the course of, a, of, of the fiscal year. Um, just to give you a perspective, $400,000 is about 0.28% of the town's budget. Um, so again, th that's the uh, summary of Article 7. We now move to Article 9, uh, which, pa which is just past the capital budget. Um, Article 9 is the school HVAC repairs and upgrades. And again, there's no action under this article. And I'll just take a moment. Uh, the reason there's no action under this article is not because we didn't address the school HVAC issues. It's because we put this as a placeholder um, in the event that all the efforts and expenses that we took would not have, would not have fallen within the um, funding op availability of the uh, federal CARES money. And so fortunately, we, we were able to do that work. Uh, and um, so again, there's no, there's no need for an appropriation from tax dollars or the town's reserves um, for Article 9. So <clears throat> that completes that. We now move on to Article 17. Um, oops, thank you. Which is, a, again, an annual appropriation, uh, I'm sorry, an annual vote regarding the Forum Ice Rink Enterprise Fund um, and again, an enterprise fund is, is the mechanism that the town has to separately account for a particular operation. In this case, the forum, you'll see in future ones for the golf course and so forth. Um, and in this case, we, we, we're seeking our estimate and working with the finance director and town accountant is that we estimate that $60,000 will flow through this fund 
um, again, that would come from the uh, operational revenues from the forum, which you may recall is, is, is administered by a um, private management company. Moving on to Article 18, this is the um, Local Public Educational Government Access and Cable Related Enterprise Fund. And here, this is, <clears throat> again, a separate accounting for because the monies for this fund come from the town's um, cable television surcharge on your Verizon or, or Comcast bills. Here, the budget request, as you, as you see, is just over $400,000 for personnel and just over $200,000 for expenses related to to PEG access, uh, and, and again, I, and I should have noted that my first article, really a vital component during this past year, providing the remote meetings and other aspects, and certainly here tonight, it, was, it just made an extraordinary effort, uh, again, to allow us to function at government and to have the outreach to the community. But also, if you notice at the bottom of the slide, uh, is there's also a request, in addition to their operating budget, to transfer, and, and I apologize for this one, it should say $65,000, as is printed in the Finance Committee booklet. It's $65,000 from the Cable, Television, Public, Educational, and Government Access Enterprise Fund free cash for the purchase and installation of two robotic cameras in the McCarthy Middle School Auditorium. Um, for those of you who may recall, we are in the midst of, of a significant renovation of the McCarthy Auditorium, and <clears throat> as part of that, they want to put in the new camera system. <clears throat> and so again, the request from Pete Padula is to uh, provide that. And, that <clears throat> and so right now, despite the concerns of people cutting the cord, cable access revenues have remained within our forecasted budget levels, and, and certainly this budget can be supported in the year ahead. We now move to Article 19, the next article. Again, here's $30,000 for the expenses related to the golf course enterprise fund. And again, the $30,000 comes from the revenues that are raised by the private management company that runs the golf course. So again, there's no... Um, there's, there's no impact on the tax levy. Again, it's our best estimate of what revenues will come in under the golf course in the year ahead. Moving to the next article, Article 20, <clears throat> this is a request working with the Board of Health for to create a new revolving fund. You, you may recall, and you'll see under the next article, under state law, we're, we're able to establish revolving funds. Uh, when they're created, they have to be voted separately, and then annually we have to renew the funding amount. Because again, how this works is, in this case, the Board of Health is seeking to establish an on-site sewage facility revolving fund, um, in which basically receipts from, that come in from the permitting, inspection, and monitoring of on-site sewage facilities, more commonly known as septic systems, um, are paid for by the applicants, and then basically that revenue is paid for the Board of Health to contract um, for the inspectors to review the plans and do the inspections and monitoring for that. And again, the estimate, because it's uncertain, is that that amount may, may run up to $75,000 in a given year. So again, the efforts for septic system inspections and plan review will, will come from applicants. It will be overseen by the Board of Health uh, and then fund those uh, at private uh, inspections. So again, there's no burden on the town or the taxpayers of the community. It's paid for by the users. The next article, as I alluded to just a moment ago, is the annual appropriation of departmental revolving funds. Under state law, where we have to establish and reauthorize the funding amount every year. My sense is I think the state just likes to keep the fact to have these articles in front of the voters of the community. But we're seeking renewal of $10,000 under our dog pound and licensing program. It's, you know, an amount not to exceed $75,000 under a senior citizen trip program, the same amount for a senior citizen respite care program that operates in this facility. Uh, the $20,000 for the police cruiser communications equipment comes from the sale of, of cruisers that are, that are surplus, and then that goes to fund the installation of new equipment and newer vehicles, replacement vehicles. Um, same thing with fire life safety equipment. Um, for seals of weights and measures inspections, that service is provided by the Northern Middlesex Council of Governments. They have they provide the inspectors who in Chelmsford and other towns who go to the gas stations, check the fueling of the gas pumps to make sure that you're getting a gallon of gas when you're you know paying for a gallon, or at the you know um, supermarket when you're at the scales and the scanners and so forth. So again, those establishments pay the fee. We contract with NIMCOG to, and pay you know from those revenues 
for those services. And then finally, you may recall a couple years ago, the cemetery department established a wreath and floral decorations fund, so therefore they can uh, provide those services for those who wish to have them. And again, the revenue for those uh, uh, pays for those direct expenses directly. So again, these are level funded from the previous year. Um, <clears throat> and then the next one it, you may call as a recurring one, it's a request from the cemetery department for $50,000 that are, comes from the sale of grave and lots to the Cemetery Improvement and Development Fund. And if many of you have traveled down uh, River Neck Road, on that side especially, um, you'll see that progress is rapidly moving on the three and a half acre expansion to Pine Ridge Cemetery. Um, <clears throat> and with this additional funding, they'll continue the screen, screening of loam, uh, spreading of loam and hydro seeding. And we'll be back at future uh, meetings for the uh, pavement uh, uh, and completion of that project. Um, and then the next one, again, a familiar one every spring, is the ongoing Community Action Program Fund, where once again we're asking for $10,000, as we have now for you know, over 25 years now, um, to provide funds for community uh, improvement projects that are done with individuals and organizations within the town. And um, it, it's a great project. We have a great committee that oversees it. And as you can see, we've done over 100 projects uh, during that period, uh, but basically you can see $130,000 of, of funding. Um, the next article is Article 29, I'm sorry, 24, the Affordable Housing Stabilization Fund. Again, this is a ministerial act. Uh, a few years ago, the community uh, established in the zoning bylaws an affordable housing stabilization fund uh, in, in which the monies come in, but town meeting has to vote the monies into the stabilization fund and then town meeting would then vote the monies out of, out of the fund. So the balance that we have in the final payment from the sale of the grist mill units is 11,250. Um, and again, what happens is, is when a project is, is approved by the planning board, they can do a payment in lieu of, and, and this is the final payment again from that particular unit. Right now, the current fund balance is over $600,000. Uh, and again, in order to expend those monies, they have to come back to town meeting and, and attain a two-thirds vote. So we now move to Article 29, um, which is, excuse me, is, is a action uh, on amending the town's general bylaws. And this follows the charter change that was approved by town meeting uh, over a year ago and also approved by the legislature last summer in which we changed the reference to the town's chief elected board of Board of Selectmen to Select Board. And so now that the charter's been amended, we now go back and, and, and change the, the references in the general bylaws. And then the next article, Article 30, is making the similar change in the town's zoning bylaws. Um, so again, we work with town council to draft this, this language, which you can see is pretty basic. It will then, if it gets approved, we'll then submit it to the Attorney General's office, and then our bylaws would then be amended um, to reference the, again, change to select board in, in the community. Um, the next article is Article 36, as we're nearing the end. Article 36 is the... Ledge Road and Dunstable Road easements. Um, this, was, again, was a placeholder article uh, which the select board considered the matter during, during uh, the last few months and decided to take no action under this article. So again, there'll be no action here. And then the final article is the last article in the warrant, Article 42, which traditionally has been set aside for street acceptances. And many of you who have been vet veteran town meeting representatives have known that the town has made a concerted effort in, in recent years and at recent town meetings to accept many longstanding roadways in the community that have not been accepted as public ways in the community for two reasons. One is it, it assures the residents on those roadways that the proper maintenance and construction and ongoing care of the roadways by the town is an accepted way. Uh, and for the community's sake, our, the money that we receive from the state through the gas tax for, um, for um, road improvements is depends upon your accepted miles of public roadway. So what, is hap what happens here is the, the DPW staff 
goes out and, and examines what needs, what needs to take place to have these roads at the accepted standard level, performs that work, and then brings it here before you this evening. So that, Mr. Moderator, concludes my overview of this article, consent agenda. Thank you. Um, does the uh, Finance Committee have a recommendation? The Finance Committee takes no action on Articles 3, 9, and 36. A majority of the Finance Committee recommends approval of both Articles 29 and 30, and the Finance Committee unanimously recommends Articles 7, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, and 42. Thank you. And uh, does, the board of uh, does the Select Board have a recommendation? The Select Board took no action on Articles 3, 9, and 36, and unanimously recommends support of the remaining articles on the consent agenda. Thank you. Okay, does anybody have any questions, comments, or discussion? Fine, then we will vote and, up. Oh, okay. Uh, David Foley, Precinct 5. Um, to, Mr. Moderator, to, you, uh, to the speaker through you. On Article 20, the on-site sewerage facility revolving fund, mm -hmm. uh, I understand that there will be increased expenses due to review, uh, permitting, inspection for on-site sewerage facilities. But my, my question is, for this period of time with this moratorium where there are no tie-ins to the sewer system, is there a corresponding reduction in the job of permitting and inspecting that would normally be done on these sites if they were to be tied into the sewer? Through you, Mr. Moderator, um, two, two, two things to, to note. One is there are tie-ins to the sewer system in this moratorium. What the moratorium provides is that only the planned uh, capacity for individual parcels is tied into the system. Um, so, so it's not as though they're not doing any sewer tie-in inspection work. The reason the fund is set up at 75,000 is the planning board just doesn't know if they're going to have, a, you know, a small handful of projects or that they may have a subdivision of the projects. Um, and so that's sort of why the amount was set at 75, and it's, it's just an unknown commodity, and therefore the alternative would have been would have been to set money in the operating budget, but then it would have been an unknown, un, you know, an uncertainty in terms of forecasting. So, so I, I guess the short answer to your question is there still will be work in the health office for um, sewer tie-ins, but what is, what, is, what is a different type of work, and in fact it requires a special expertise in terms of septic system, permit review and design is not in-house, and therefore this fund would, would perform that work. So it's, it's, the other alternative would have been to hire in-house staff or train in-house staff to get those licensors, and really this, we believe, is the preferred route. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Apparently there is none. So um, a vote in favor of this will be to approve all of these 15 articles, um, even the three that are, there's no action, and uh, a vote against would be against, and an abstention it is what it is. This does require a two-thirds vote. The nature of this consent agenda is such that if anyone really wants to debate one of these articles that gets lumped into this uh, combination, they can say so and it will be withdrawn and, and voted on normally. But it appears that the town meeting reps have gotten used to this notion and uh, uh, agree with the, uh, the, the principle that it is uh, speeding up the process on a number of articles that would be and the article passes unanimously voted on anyway Mr. manager thank you Mr. Mario. article two is to request amendments to the fiscal year 2021 operating budget which is the operating budget that we're going to complete in two weeks uh, this fiscal year so as you can imagine when the budget was approved uh, a year ago at town meeting 
you know, what's expectation and what becomes reality, uh, you know, it certainly differs, and particularly during this extraordinary year. So here we're seeking to transfer $60,000 of surplus snow and ice removal revenues and $125,000 from the Finance Committee Reserve Fund to the following five uh, budget line items in the budget. The first one, as you can see, is municipal administration expenses, $52,000. Uh, next one is out of district education expenses, $2,000. Uh, next is public safety personnel services, $11,000. Public safety expenses, $60,000. And public work expenses, $60,000. And, and now I'll go into the detail behind these numbers, uh, which, again, were developed by our town accountant and finance director as we sort of sat down and project how we're going to close out the fiscal year in two weeks. Uh, prior to the auditor's arrival and, and review of our books. The first one under municipal administration, $54,000. Um, and this one is probably very familiar to you if you've seen what's going on, certainly in, in society. It had to do with MIS and data processing. Um, we, we incurred an expense of $20,000 to do a cybersecurity assessment of the town's data systems in order to avoid the data breaches as well as the ransomware that's going on in the community. Um, in addition to this expenditure, we've also enrolled our employees in a cyber uh, training program that's an ongoing training where we're working with state agency to do testing, training, and, and homework assignments and so forth so that we can avoid the issues of malware and so forth. So again, this was extraordinary uh, and again, a, a, we believe a sound investment uh, to our operations. The next aspect was $32,000 under our legal budget. Uh, the legal budget for this past year was $175,000, and it was actually a reduced budget um, from where it historically had been at. Um, but we've, we've, we've exceeded that budget as we come to a close, as we're awaiting what will be the final month of invoices for June uh, from both our Labor Council and from our Legal Council. Uh, and our best estimate is that $32,000 will, will fill that gap. Um, Again, legal depends upon the caseload of what's going on. For example, back in fiscal year 2018, we expended $205,000 in, in legal budget. So again, it fluctuates. Most years it comes under. This year it came over because of a number of, of particularly labor actions that, that we dealt with. Um, the next one is out of town tuition. And, and what that is, is we, as, you, as you know, we're member of communities of the Chelmsford Public Schools as, as well as Neshoba Tech. But we also have a, a handful of students who travel to out-of-district um, schools that are, that are covered by, by neither district, and those fall under the town's general uh, operating budget, whether it's the agricultural tech or Essex tech and so forth. And so in this case, we, have a, we, we, we not only have to pay the uh, tuition assessment, which we had budgeted for based upon what we knew a year ago, and we have a similar budget for this year, upcoming year, but it turns out that our, uh, our our budget was under by $2,000 once we sorted out uh, through the COVID and everything with transportation and, and student enrollment. So again, it's a $2,000 appropriation shortfall on that, uh, on that line item. Moving on to public safety operations, we, we, we really ran into some extraordinary vehicle maintenance expenses in the fire department. Uh, and we also had to acquire um, four new sets of turnout gear beyond what was forecast in the traditional budget for the fire department. Um, so again, we need to cover those costs, costs. And then in the building department, we had a turnover in the building commissioner position, where again, we had to pay out for an outgoing inspector uh, and then have a replacement in there. So we need $11,000 to close the fiscal year. And then in public works, and this was a result of the pandemic, um, we, we exceeded our tonnage forecast under the budget, um, and so our, our shortfall is $50,000 uh, in terms of tonnage costs because people were home and therefore using the residential disposal system and also dining at home doing takeout where a lot of those expenses may not have occurred through our residential trash collection. Uh, and then we also had a minor increase in costs in our solar um, array system that, that flows through our street lighting budget. And, and again, the two fund sources of funding of this are the 60000 from the transfer of, from public works uh, and then $125,000 from the Finance Committee Reserve Fund. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Does the Finance Committee have a recommendation? The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 2. Does the Select Board have a recommendation? The Select Board unanimously recommends approval of Article 2. 
Thank you. This is an opportunity for um, questions or debate. There being none, we will now vote on Article 2. This Article 2 is a kind of a mop-up article to uh, tidy up loose ends from uh, at the close of this fiscal year, pluses and minuses in the budget. Um, again, it's uh, there's always a certain small pot of money that the Finance Committee itself has uh, at its disposal. It's about $400,000 a year, and some of that money went into defraying these last-minute expenses. Again, all in the, uh, for the sake of uh, maintaining a, a level budget. Also helped that the snow budget uh, wasn't exceeded this past winter. Although we the article passes 132 in favor, four opposed, no abstentions. Now we go to Article 4. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm pleased to turn over the podium to our superintendent of Neshoba Valley Technical School District, Dr. Denise Pigeon, who will be doing the presentation for Neshoba Tech this evening. Hello. Ooh, sorry. Good evening. I'm pleased to let you know that I'm also joined here this evening with three members representing Neshoba Tech School Committee, um, Donald Ayer, Sam Poulton, Lawrence McDonald, and our alternate, Claire Chenot, as well. Um, also in the back of the room, um, from our business office, Michelle Shepard and Michelle Cody. Um, I first have to echo the comments of Paul Cohen with a special thank you to our school nurses and our public health nurses, and a special thank you to Sue Rosa and her team. Um, as you know, Chelmsford is our largest town, and we did work very closely with the Board of Health from Chelmsford through this most unusual year, and they were very helpful and very supportive. I know that I have to be brief tonight, but I wanted to share with you a couple of photos that really echo what our year looked like here at Neshoba Tech. Um, those of you familiar with our building, this is a picture of our Viking Forum, which is connected to our gymnasium, and a picture of our cafeteria, both of which were modified to serve as space for our technical programming. Um, we were pleased that we were open full-time on students' technical weeks so that they could learn their technical skills, because we knew that it was very difficult to replicate technical education at home. Um, so whatever it takes, so it's a, a great photo to, to document that. Um, and again, ending the year with a graduation that looked very traditional, so we were very pleased um, to be able to host graduation outside and with our, our guests this year. Um, when we talk about the budget, enrollment is a very important piece. Um, as you know, a, the district member assessments is calculated based on enrollment. The overall enrollment change at Neshoba Tech actually increased by 13 district students, which is an unusual trend ac across the state. Many schools were experiencing a decline in enrollment. We actually had an increase in enrollment. In terms of how that looks specific to Chelmsford, the town of Chelmsford actually had an increase of 12 students from your town attending Neshoba Tech, which also caused a slight increase in the percentage of students from Chelmsford as part of the overall percentage of enrollment at Neshoba Tech. Um, just looking at the, the historical enrollment history, again, we've been on an, an increase in enrollment over several years, but we have still not hit our historical enrollment high, which was back in 1976 when there were 313 students from the town of Chelmsford attending Neshoba Tech. Um, we were able to complete um, several uh, capital projects this year, including the complete renovation of our dental and health program as part of a workforce skills capital grant. We were able to do a virtualization project with our servers. Um, our students in electrical have been working on replacing the lighting system throughout the school, and we did many building modifications in order to be able to open our technical programs for um, in-person learning. We'll continue through the FY22 budget. We have level funded our capital project plan for next year, and we'll continue working on our fire suppression system, some parking lot repairs, et cetera. Um, we always give you an update in terms of stabilization and OPEB. Again, we're comfortable with the level of stabilization. We do not plan to fund it in FY22, and we are continuing to move forward with our goal of funding OPEB um, at $200,000 through the FY22 budget. Special thank you to Paul Cohen for serving on our OPEB trust committee. 
Um, the budget, the big picture budget overview is a 2.42% increase overall from last year to this year. So 2.42% increase. Some of the major summary of changes from last year to this year, we did have to capture in our budget the addition of a second school nurse that we added in this year um, that was absolutely necessary and the increase of our social worker position from part-time to full-time. Um, in terms of the revenue, as you know, as a regional school district, there's some revenue that comes from um, non-member town payments and then there's revenue that comes from the member assessments. Um, this year, we are seeking um, just over 10.6 million from our member towns, and this works again through the enrollment. Um, 212 students from Chelmsford, it goes through a formula, a state formula, uh, calculated by enrollment, which brings us to the Chelmsford FY22 assessment of just over 3.7 million. Um, looking at last year's assessment to this year's assessment, again, the major driving factor in the increase to the town of Chelmsford is actually the increase in enrollment or the increase of 12 students. And in closing, I just have to also give a special thank you to our many business partners and industry partners that um, even through COVID still continue to work with us to employ our students through cooperative placement and also continue to work with us virtually on our program advisory committees. Many of these businesses are, are right here in the town of Chelmsford. Thank you for your time. Thank you. With 15 seconds to spare. <laughs> uh, does uh, the Finance Committee have a recommendation? The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 4. And does the Select Board have a recommendation? The Select Board unanimously recommends approval of Article 4. Any questions or discussion with respect to the Neshoba Valley Technical High School budget? There being none, we shall now vote on Article 4. Those of you who have watched town meeting for many years can remember a time when the annual uh, presentation by the Neshoba Tech uh, superintendent was one fraught with tension and uh, debate, to put it kindly. Um, in recent years, the the tenor of the discussion has become much more uh, comfortable. We're comfortable with each other. We understand where the Neshoba budget is coming from. It's being and the article passes unanimously, 137 in favor. By the unanimous vote. Article 5. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Under the portion of the town's operating budget under Article 5, it's the Chelmsford Public Schools budget. And I'm pleased to turn the podium over for the presentation to Dr. Jay Lang. All right, good evening, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well. Happy to be back in person. Uh, to share our budget highlights with you tonight. Before we jump into some of the financials, uh, this has been a little bit of a hectic year for us, and we just wanted to talk a little bit about what uh, school was like in the Challenge for Schools this particular year. Last summer, we spent a lot of time uh, working through uh, different state advisories and whatnot to figure out what we'd be able to do for school, and we had to be able to put a program together this year to very quickly adjust based on what was happening in the community as far as health trends. Um, so we had to prepare uh, programs for full in-person learning if we were able to do that, hybrid, which would have some students at home, some students in classrooms, and then we also had to be prepared for uh, being fully remote uh, if we had to this particular year. We implemented a um, kind of a phased approach to mitigation uh, to be able to uh, remain open. Uh, we have cleaning contractors in our buildings. We had increased contracts and have uh, some additional bodies uh, helping us out. Our custodial cleaning crew did an incredible job uh, keeping our schools clean and, uh, and healthy this year. We work very closely with the town and uh, DPW for some HVAC upgrades in our schools uh, to again uh, work on filtering and air purification, which was excellent. Uh, we implemented uh, social distancing practices within the schools, uh, hand washing, wearing masks. Uh, we had different spacing requirements we had to, main to maintain throughout the course of the year. 
And we also, come the springtime, uh, implemented uh, COVID pool testing within the buildings to be able to identify any COVID cases we'd have to, again, help us with our mitigation to keep our schools open. And then very late in the, uh, the winter, early spring, we worked to uh, get vaccination uh, to our staff and our students, bless you, our students actually recently uh, started being vaccinated as well. So uh, it was really a multi-pronged approach to keeping the schools open this year. Some of the things that I'm most proud of um, is that we actually transitioned on the fly about 5,000 students from a traditional in-person learning environment to, again, hybrid uh, remote scenarios. We had to deploy about 6,000 pieces of equipment uh, to staff and families to use this past year. Uh, we had a synchronous model of instruction that took place all year, so whether you were, uh, had students in front of you in a classroom or other students were at home watching, they were all maintaining and taking part in the same lessons. Um, we had received accommodation actually from the state for being able to do that. I'm very proud of the fact that we were able to maintain um, relationships in our schools, our after school activities, our clubs, athletics. We were able to keep that going and try to have uh, school be as normal as it could be during a pandemic. And again, I think that focus on relationships was critical. Um, I am also proud that over the course of this whole year, we only had to shut down for two days. Uh, the two days following Christmas vacation, we went fully remote uh, to be able to do some contact tracing because we had some staff and families that traveled over the holidays, and we didn't want to open up our schools to any uh, increased COVID uh, cases. So that worked really well. And really, with the exception of those two days, we had students in our building uh, all year long. I cannot say enough about our staff. Our staff went above and beyond this year and had to adjust on the fly to traditional in-person teaching, to learn how to do hybrid teaching, remote teaching. Um, it was an absolute incredible year from our teachers, our support staff, uh, custodians, CAF workers, right down the line. Everyone could, could not have worked uh, more. Our parents um, have always been supportive. They also had to be teachers. And that was an adjustment for our parents. And they supported us all along the way. It was really incredible what they did. And then our kids. I would put them up against any kids in the, the country. Uh, they really stepped up and did a phenomenal job. Uh, they were persistent. Uh, they got through COVID with us. Uh, we closed school yesterday for the year. Uh, I think everyone is looking forward to the fall and coming back in person. Uh, it was a collective effort, and I can't thank the community enough, again, staff, students, families, for supporting us and working uh, through this with us. Um, I'm going to flip through the next few slides um, quickly, being mindful of the time. Uh, we have some comparable districts. I always share information with you on this uh, each year. Uh, we have 10 comps that we look at in the state. When we look at our student-teacher ratio uh, in Chelmsford, we fall uh, right about in the middle of our comparable uh, communities. When we look at average teacher salary, that's always a benchmark we look at. We actually fall in the bottom third of the communities. Uh, when we look at our pure pupil expenditures, again, we're right in the middle. Uh, so we're always in that middle, lower third. Uh, but our performance, we outperform districts. So when we look at our 10th grade ELA scores, uh, we're actually at the top. Uh, we're at the very top of our comparable districts. We're proud of that. When we look at our math scores, uh, we're again at the top with two other communities at 80% of our kids either meeting or exceeding the uh, standards, which we're just, we think is fantastic. Um, so again, we're really outperforming our spending. We're very appreciative of all the spending we receive. The budget before you this evening is a level service budget for the school department. Uh, it's going to maintain all the staff and services uh, this next year that we maintain this year. We're going to be utilizing semester funding to be able to fill in some of the holes for next year. Uh, and we are requesting, I'm just flipping through these slides for you, uh, $65 million as our budget for uh, next year. I finished right on time. <laughs> Thank you. Happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, does the Finance Committee have a recommendation? The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 5. Select Board have a recommendation. The Select Board unanimously recommends approval of Article 5. School Committee. The school, school Committee unanimously approved the budget. Thank you. Any uh, questions, presenter, comments? Wonderful. Um, we will now vote on the uh, school, uh, Chelmsford Public School Committee uh, budget. And as you can see, the, the, the lack of debate uh, signifies on the part of these town meeting reps anyway, a certain confidence in the process by which the, the budget was assembled and, and approved uh, by the town manager, uh, Paul Cohen, and uh, Dr. Lang, the superintendent. 
uh, astoundingly, you're looking at a unanimous approval, which is just not the way it used to be uh, 10, 15 years ago. This the debate over the school department. Thank you budget, again for your support. And the, and the uh, article passes forward. unanimously, 136 in favor. Okay, uh, Article 6 is the remaining of the challenge budget, the general government operating budget for the upcoming year. You can see the dollar amounts requested in, from raising and appropriating $68 million plus the other funding sources that go into the operating budget. And as I noted in the Article 2, we vote our general uh, budget by line items by, as presented here, municipal administration, out of district education, public safety, public works, facilities, cemetery, community services, library. Uh, benefits and insurance, debt and interest. Um, so as an overview, the budget this year is $144.5 million operating budget. Um, that's a, uh, an increase from the $140.6 million operating budget in total from the prior year. Again, that includes schools, uh, Neshoba Tech, and, and the general government of the town. The property tax levy for the upcoming year is forecast to be at $113.5 million. Um, the state aid is $17.8 million as forecast. At, at this point, the legislature, uh, both branches of the legislature have, have come to a resolution on local aid or state aid to the community. Unfortunately, we're a minimum state aid community uh, in terms of education funding. So the funding for this upcoming year at $17.8 million is only $400,000 above the $17.4 million that we receive um, in the current fiscal year. In, in, in local receipts, that comes from your motor vehicle excise, uh, vehicles, uh, meals, uh, hotel rooms, and, and, and permit fees, and so forth. This year, it's $9.6 million. For the year that we're finishing up right now, it's $8.9 million. Obviously, as we're coming out of COVID, we, we're forecasting an increase as we return to normalcy in terms of meals, rooms, and, and, and motor vehicle, and so forth. Um, we've obviously seen that activity uh, accelerate in the last month or so as we've exited the pandemic. And again, hopeful, but being conservative because the state asks us to be conservative in terms of what those revenues would be in the upcoming year. And then the last one, the $3.6 million of available funds, that's essentially almost unchanged. That, again, comes from um, funding sources that such as the sewer stabilization fund that pays a debt service uh, as well as benefits and others from child care funds and so forth. So again, it's an available fund, but in, in essence, it's level serviced. But as noted uh, by Dr. Lang in his presentation, again, it's, it's pretty much a level service budget. The Chelmsford Public Schools, as we noted, is $65 million. The other town departmental budgets is $32 million. That's only a $1.1 million increase over the prior year that we're finishing up in two weeks. The big increase in funding is um, under benefits and insurance um, of $26.9 million. That's obviously, that's driven by the Middlesex County Retirement Assessment that increases as they uh, update their actuarial schedules every two years in terms of pension obligations of a community. Um, and also our health insurance uh, budget increases as well with the increase in health insurance premiums. And then finally, our debt service is in a good spot where, where debt service is declining. We're by uh, $800,000 to $12.7 $12 million, or decline of almost 6%. When you look into the general government line items, as, as noted, it's really a level service, which basically means we take the same staff, we apply the final year of our collective bargaining agreements, as well as the personnel pay plan into the budget totals uh, for the year ahead. And, and, but the really extraordinary changes are really these three items. As I noted earlier, our waste disposal and tipping fee increase for the upcoming year will be $390,000 or almost a third. What's happening there is the amount of cost per ton that it takes the town to dispose of its solid waste at the trash to energy facility in um, Haverhill, the Covanta facility, is going up from $72 per ton to $90 per ton. And that's a major increase, and, and, there is, and it, it also explains why sometimes your trash gets delayed every, very often in the community. It's not because the private companies are incompetent. The problem that's going on here, and we've seen this for years, is the Commonwealth, is, as well as other states in the area, are no longer licensing or constructing new landfill 
new landfills and certainly not even new trash to energy facilities like we send our material to for two reasons. One is because of the costs and environmental concerns, and the second one is nobody wants those facilities in their community. So when we go out and bid for our solid waste disposal and to, uh, to bring our trash to a location, um, we, we bid as a consortium with eight other towns in the area, including Tewksbury and Dracut and so forth. Um, but our choices are either the plant that's in, in, in Haverhill, the plant that's in um, an Andover, North Andover, sorry, the, the uh, Wheeler Brader facility, uh, and other options such as by rail to other states or other transportation expenses. Um, and, and again, this is, the, this is the result of the market that's out there, and, and it's, just, it's just an unfortunate reality of what's going on, um, as well as, the, again, we have additional tonnage and as well as additional costs. Um, and then on the waste, re the waste and recycling collection, that's going up by 4% under the contractual obligations. So that budget's going from $1.82 million to $1.9 million. Um, and then finally, when we constructed our budget inside our, our, our budget in the police department expenditures, um, during this past year, uh, we, we, we um, re reduced by one the number of police vehicles to be replaced. We're now restoring that to, to a third, um, th third police vehicle at an, an additional $65,000. Um, so, Mr. Moderator, that's the overview of the town's operating budget. Thank you. Does the Finance Committee have a recommendation? The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 6. Does the Select Board have a recommendation? The Select Board unanimously recommends approval of Article 6. Any questions? Discussion? Uh, hello, uh, my name's Tom Amiro from uh, District 7. And yeah, my question is just, if we eliminate food waste from the uh, waste stream, would that help to reduce the cost, you know, in the future? It, it may, and, and the, the Commonwealth is looking at it. Right now, the only community that we know of who has a residential food waste collection is the town of Hamilton. Um, right. And so we're looking at it, but we just don't think we're ready there to do it. I mean, obviously, we encourage residents to do home composting, um, and, and the state requires restaurants and commercial facilities to, to dispose of, uh, recycle and compost or their, their waste. But right now, we're just not there for residential. But it may be something that we see in the next few years. Yeah. I mean, what I'm thinking of is municipal um, food scrap. Um, exactly. You know, pick up. Hmm. You know, not just composting. and. Just keep it out of the uh, landfill. Well, in our case, it's going to a an incinerator. Incinerator, so it's not producing methane in a landfill. That's good. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? There being none, we will now uh, vote on Article uh, Six. Manager Paul Cohen had hoped to keep up with the school committee and have a unanimous vote himself. It's going to be close. It's one descending vote. And the article passes 138 in favor, one opposed, and one abstention. Article 8, I believe. Eight. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Marty. Article 8 is the town's fiscal year 2022 capital expenditure budget. I'm going to turn the podium over to John Souza, our finance director, who chairs the capital planning committee and, and really you know, assembles all the materials under this budget who provide the presentation and answer the questions along with our department heads that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Good evening, everyone. Just to provide you with a hi some highlights of our capital plan this year. So this first slide just shows um, just uh, the capital plan broken out by functional area. If you take a look at this, you can see that the um, most significant investments this year are in the areas of school buildings, school technology, and public works, as you would expect. The total uh, capital plan is just under 3.9 million. 
There is a contribution from the Child Care Revolving Fund of 75000 which I'll talk about more later, and that brings the total amount to be borrowed down to just over $3.8 I'm just going to scroll through these projects. There's a list in the Spiral Brown budget book that, on page H3 that lists all of these projects, so in the interest of time, we'll scroll through that. The first one in the area of municipal technology is a door security upgrade project and this is part of the town's ongoing efforts to transition our municipal buildings um, away from the older mechanical lock type systems over to electronic uh, swipe and actually swipes have now been uh, upgraded to touch pads if you will and this is to focus on um, the police station and center fire station. The next project under community services actually involves the facility that we're gathered in tonight. There's 316,000 in the plan to repave the front and rear parking areas of this facility and also includes a review by public works and facilities of the parking space layout to see if any additional spaces can be accommodated since parking spaces are often at a premium at this site. Uh, next we move on to our public libraries. Uh, the first project is slated for Adams Library. This is in, to install an emergency generator at a cost of 145000 The goal of this project is to provide a cooling station uh, should we lose uh, power during a summer storm or other natural disaster, or also a warming station uh, should we have a natural disaster or storm during the winter. Uh, so that, that covers the installation of that. Next, a couple more library projects. Uh, the this is the third and final phase of the carpet replacement at Adams Library at a cost of 25000 The next project is a computer replacement. This is the second phase of the library's efforts to upgrade the computers used by staff and the public. And the, the just under 38000 covers the replacement of 32 units at the Adams Library and five units at the McKay Branch Library. Next, we move on to the police department. Uh, 32,000 is included for the purchase of some electronic um, speed and message um, advisory signs. Similar to, the, it includes one like similar to that you see in the picture. Also, two smaller ones that can be mounted on poles. This is to assist the police department with um, speed enforcement and traffic safety issues throughout the town. Moving on to our fire department. Uh, 61,000 is included to fund the replacement of an SUV vehicle uh, type vehicle. Also, 76,000 is included to replace the a plow truck that's used to plow all of the fire stations during winter storms. And the existing plow truck will be repurposed as a backup truck for the same purpose. You can see the truck being replaced as a 2012 uh, Ford F-350. Also in the fire department, uh, you see in this photo, this is a picture of a, uh, a hydraulic lift that's used to um, lift, um, used by the mechanic to lift heavy apparatus. The lift is uh, 30 years old and it's at the end of its useful life, as you see. The cost of that project is just over 150,000. Moving on to public works, uh, th these are some of the uh, traditional infrastructure type projects that you've seen in the past. 350,000 is included for sidewalk construction, 400,000 for road improvements. Uh, some of the sidewalks that will be targeted are North Road, Bill Ricker Road, some ADA improvements along those sites. And the roadways are based on our engineering management survey that Public Works has done, performed each year. And those roads include um, Hall Road, El Dorado Road, and Clydesdale Road. A couple of more public works projects. Uh, the picture on the, your left is the um, replacing a 1998 piece of sidewalk snow removal equipment uh, at a cost of 170000 and also a medium duty truck for the parks division at a cost of 75000 Moving on to municipal facilities, this is a building I'm sure many of you are familiar with if you've ever driven behind Chumsford High School. This is actually, it's a steel building. This houses uh, municipal facilities. This is the, basically all their shop equipment. The building's over 30 years old and it's, it needs some uh, definite repairs for the walls and roof. And this also funds improvements to a smaller building that's also nearby that facilities uses to house off-season equipment. So for example, in the summer, 
winter equipment is stored in this, in this building and vice versa. Also under municipal, excuse me, municipal facilities, uh, 165,000 is included to fund um, the, the replacement of these three older vehicles that you see here with um, newer hybrid models to save fuel. Um, two, at least two of these vehicles will be recycled, and, if you will, and they'll be transferred to a little um, less demanding, less demanding roles um, at, um, one is slated for the senior center and one is slated for the library. Next, uh, under municipal facilities, uh, the next project is the installation of the roof um, ladders, safety ladders that you see there in the photo, and skylight safety grates at a cost of 45000 Also, just under 50000 is included for a building insulation project to add ins better insulation to the underside of the roof and exterior walls at the Chumsford Center for the Arts, uh, formerly known as the Old Town Hall in Chumsford Center. School facilities. This first project is at a cost of 597000 It's a door hardware upgrade uh, at, for the Byam Harrington schools and also the uh, Westland, uh, Westlands Community Ed Center. And the uh, objectives of this project are really twofold. The first is to replace the existing hardware with the lever style locks that you see here in the photo. And then the other thing to keep in mind is that you know, most of our schools were built in the 1960s, and it was really well before you had a lot of the uh, things going on that you see in the world uh, where, where safety is more, more on everyone's mind more than it ever has been. And the new locks will also be, um, provide for a higher degree of safety for, for uh, students and staff, which will allow them to um, lock the doors from the inside to keep out a possible, um, any possible threat. Going on to, um, Next project for under school facilities is the replacement of um, flooring at the Harrington School at a cost of just over 29000 You see in the right photo there are a number of uh, tiles that are either cracked or damaged that require replacement. The other photo on the left is a little dark, uh, but I can explain that. There are a number of um, steel uh, partitions that separate the um, fixtures in all of the student restrooms, and they, many of them... Um, have been there since Center School underwent its major renovation several years ago, and they've, they have extensive corrosion, so those are slated to be replaced at a cost of 30000 Next, there's a kitchen upgrade plan for the Westlands Community Ed Center at a cost of um, 227000 and it, covers, it includes all of the things that you see there, the new equipment, the non-slip flooring, uh, new student serving lines, and this, this project is being partially funded by a $75,000 contribution from the Child Care Fund to um, reimburse for a portion of the, care, uh, of the project that will be used by the Child Care Program. Uh, so that will reduce the, the cost of that that we'll, the town will need to borrow. Moving on, a couple more sc school facility projects. Um, there's a kitchen ventilation upgrade planned for the South Row School at just under $76,000. There's an exterior lift or elevator at the Parker School that's planned to be replaced at a cost of 127000 And then finally, there is, uh, this is the last, uh, last, this is really the last phase. Uh, the school department has been going and upgrading the surveillance and security systems at a number of schools in town. Uh, this project is just under 600000 and this will complete the, up, the security system upgrade for um, all four elementary schools that you see, Byam, Center, Harrington, and South Row. So that concludes a look at the capital plan. Um, following town meeting consideration tonight, uh, the next steps would be the town would seek to um, issue municipal bonds to finance these projects. So that concludes a look at all of the projects. If there are any questions, I will be glad to answer those. Does the Finance Committee have a recommendation? The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 8. Select Board have a recommendation. The Select Board unanimously recommends approval of Article 8. Mary France, Precinct 6. Just a question, John. I appreciate that you're going to repurpose the vehicles to other departments. 
Is this a domino effect? Do those other departments have a vehicle which will then disappear? Or are we simply expanding the number of use vehicles we're using in town? Mr. Moderator, to answer the previous speaker's question, the, the, both the library and the senior center have two very old vehicles that um, are at the end of the useful life. So at the senior center, for example, has an older, a very old, I believe it's eight, at least 18 years old, it's a Toyota Echo. That will be taken out of service. And then the library currently has a pickup truck that's very old, and that will be taken out of service as well. So it won't be adding extra vehicles to those departments. It, but it's a domino effect. And what right. happens to the vehicles you're eliminating? Where do those go? They'll, oh, the older, auction, the older vehicles right. will be sold at, at an auction, surplus auction. Thank you. David Rand, Precinct 2. Um, Adams Library Generator, 145,000. Um, in the 50 years I've lived here, I've only seen a week when there was, you know, the power was shut down at Chelmsford. Uh, Otherwise, you know, it, that building wouldn't get that cold in a day or two. And uh, I, I just don't see where it warrants that, especially where we can't uh, seem to open the uh, McKay Library here in North Chelmsford. It uh, needs air filtration. And uh, the other thing is the Adams Library is in a historic zone, and it's, uh, you know, we're trying to beautify it and stuff. And this piece of industrial equipment out there is not going to add to the uh, to the center. I, uh, I is, is is that a question? I'm 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 asking you legitimately. Are you are you asking a question or are you are you arguing? Okay. Uh, has has would the historical society approved the generator for that zone? It's, the Adams Library is not in the historic district, to the best of my knowledge. So, um, I'd like to make a motion to, to cancel the generator. It, uh, oh, you would have to file a, a, an amendment, a motion to amend. Uh, we can give you the form. Okay. You have the form? Yeah. Just... Come up to the town clerk's office. She'll give you one. <coughs> While that is going on, go ahead. Good evening, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Ginger Skook, um, Precinct 6. Um, Mr. Moderator, to you, through, through you to the uh, speaker. Um, John, could you please uh, give some details on, on how the sidewalk construction projects um, are chosen and things this past year um, has been big on sidewalks, so trying to understand how the uh, $350,000 towards sidewalk construction is, is uh, determined. Mr. Moderator, for that, I, I would like to ask um, our public works director or assistant public works, works director to comment on that. Uh, could I just ask, is it, was the speaker asking about last year's capital or, the, or what's planned no, for no, this year? Oh, this, for this coming year. Okay, I can, I can help you with that. Um, Yeah, it's, um, okay, it's, um, the sidewalks, the work, the work is planned for the North Road, um, some reconstruction work on Bill Ricker Road, and, and, and ADA improvements, but I'm going to ask uh, Steve Johnley, Assistant uh, DPW Director, he can provide some more details. Thank you, John. Yeah, just as John noted, um, we planned on doing some additional brickwork in the center uh, along North Road, along the Common, or up to the Common, I should say, and then some reconstruction on Bill Ricker Road, uh, just past the state project that's currently underway from like Community Tree down towards uh, Progress Ave. Okay, great. Mr. Moderator, you can start the clock. Um, I'd just like to 
say that as beautiful as the brickwork is in our town center, the continued expansion of that project and maintenance that it is continuing to bring is taking away from our ability to add sidewalks throughout the neighborhoods where our children actually are. And if this year has shown us anything is that the transportation issues are not always secure. I live within one mile of both the elementary school and middle school that my children attend. I had to transport my children back and forth to those because the roads that they would have had to traverse are not passable by foot without sidewalks being added. We have a town plan. It has many areas where sidewalks are supposedly being put in and projects and time and again we come to, to town meeting and to the town budget and we're talking about putting more bricks in the center. I love that we have a historic area, but it continues to concern me that we are focusing on one small area with this rather expensive maintenance issue. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy Tepperty, Precinct 1, Mr. Moderator, through you to the previous speaker. I have a couple quick questions. Hopefully they're really simple. On the first one, that's the Engineering Highway Division, where you talk about um, same thing on the, the sidewalks. Oh, no, that's sorry, wrong one. Uh, the next page was the annual line striping. Uh, so we were on High Street. High Street was one of the debacles, for want of another word, where they painted it and then we had it taken off because the roads weren't wide enough. Is, is there some consideration that goes into making sure that the, wide, the roads are wide enough to paint these roads uh, so that it doesn't happen again as it happened on High Street and Robin Hill? My understanding is um, certain roads are designated as scenic roads and that I, I can ask our, our public works director to, to address that, but my understanding is they would be, that would, the restriping would, would be covering roads that already have stripes. I don't think they would be looking, I want to speak for them, but I don't think they would be going out to look to add new striping. If, if that's, is if it's just a restripe, I understand that, but I can't tell. Yep, okay, they're indicating you. it's restriping. Thank you. Um, the next one is at your uh, elementary schools when you're doing the more than half a million dollars of, of doorknobs, and, and I don't mean to put down doorknobs, I think that these, it's important. Are you putting doorknobs on, or handles or whatever the right term is, on um, every door in the building? How many handles is that? Because I just, half a million dollars is a, a lot of money for doorknobs. Mr. Moderator, may I ask um, our Public Works Director Gary Persichetti to address that question? Sure. Good evening. This is um, the last phase of the buildings that are left. The high school, the two middle schools have been done, um, what we are, and so has the South Row. What we are going to accomplish here is more than just handles on doors. Uh, we're going to be replacing doors that have delaminated through the years if they have, some outer doors. In the hallways, we have to make sure that all fire doors still close properly uh, during an event, which are all on uh, automatically with the fire alarm, all of those will be checked at the same time. And the one thing this is doing within the district is it's making all the buildings in town that we've done so far and hope to continue to do all be under one lock system. So the school department, meaning the superintendent at school, can go in any one of his eight schools with one key. Each principal will have one key for their particular building, but it will not work in the other buildings. So basically, we're putting all of these buildings, and then the town has that same system in some buildings that we've done and hope to continue. So that are the individual classrooms also getting? A absolutely, including the closets if they need to be. This whole thing is for safety more than anything else. It goes along with the Alice program as well of um, keeping the, the children safe during, you know, problems within or if there's any 
anyone coming into the buildings. Thank you. Okay, You're then welcome. My, my next question is on the schools with the kitchen upgrades. Um, I'm a little bit confused. You said it was 227K this year. Is that, and then adding in the 75K that we're getting from the child care, or are we removing 75K from that total budget? I, I wasn't sure which way to understand that. Mr. Moderator, answer the previous speaker's question. The total cost of the project at the Westlands Community Ed Center is $227,700, and the $75,000 will be um, offsetting that, so the town would only need to borrow about $152,700 to fund that project. Okay, and I know that we're only talking about this year, but the next two years you have uh, other schools that are uh, over $600,000. Is there, are they that much bigger? It's just um, the, what the, the school department has been systematically going through and ha has had a long-term plan to upgrade the kitchen facilities, um, and that's something they've been working on for a number of years, moving throughout um, several, several school sites to upgrade the kitchens. So will this three that are listed here then conclude that update for the, for the schools until the next time we have to update schools, uh, kitchens? Yes, that's that's my understanding. I, you're looking at the long the long term, the five year plan. I am. Yep. It's on page H forty. Yep. Yeah. So this 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 um, as you said, this will conclude. Uh, you can see out through um, fiscal year twenty four. So, um, as you said, um, fiscal year twenty three covers the McCarthy Middle School and then Chumsford High School. Of course, a very large facility. That's for also for, um, for fiscal year, that's for fiscal year 24. There's actually a, a misprint there uh, in, the, in that page. But um, that will conclude um, the, the kitchen upgrades. Across the schools, thank you. Okay, last question, I promise. Um, the last one was on the, the elementary school um, cameras. Does that then cover all the schools? Are we done with the middle school, the high school? Yes. On? Yes, so the high schools, uh, has, that project's been funded previously and the two middle schools. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chris Lavalley, Precinct 4. Uh, through you, Mr. Moderator, to the speaker. Um, when we go to borrow uh, the money for the, uh, the bonds for these capital funds, what factors go into our interest rate? I'm sorry, could you just repeat that before the interest rate? I just didn't. When we go uh, to borrow this, these funds, um, what factors go into determining the interest rate we're getting on this borrowing? A key, a key component is our bond rating. So uh, most cities and towns either you go, go through Moody's or Standard & Poor's. We have traditionally um, had Standard & Poor's as our credit rating agency. And they look at, it, they look at the town's stability, uh, financial stability, management, a number of factors go into that rating, and um, you know we, we are a double double A plus community. Uh, we're just one notch below triple A, and that's a that's a key component. Also, the market interest rates play a big role. Uh, for example, we've been in a long term, um, very low, ultra low interest rate environment. Um, just looking, reading the tea leaves, that may change. Should we see inflation come back? It seems like the Fed may be backing off some of the easing they're doing. So I would say market and your bond rating play a, play a big component. Okay, thank you. Uh, you can start the clock now. Um, as you just mentioned, one of the key factors is the stability of management um, in our town. And it was reported this week in the Wicked Local article that the town manager still does not have a contract. Um, and his contract is currently up at June 30th, after which he becomes an employee at will. In my opinion, we need a little bit more stability in this town. Okay, Mr. Lavalley, I, I, I see where you're going with this, and, and I think that the, the members of town meeting are aware of, of Mr. Cohen's uh, involvement in reducing uh, or improving our bond rating, um, and, and I just don't want us to start to go down the mm -hmm. pro and anti-Cohen discussion in town meeting. I understand. I'm just very concerned that the instability will affect our ability to um, get good interest rates on these, these loans for these capital projects. And, and, and town meeting really does not have a say in that, sadly. 
Okay. I understand. I'm just trying to figure out how I need to be voting on this, these capital projects uh, if, if there's so much instability. Yes. I'll take them. Well, I, I can understand where he's trying to, to understand the financing aspect of it. Um, what I would suggest, Mr. Lavalle, is that the Finance Committee and the Select Board have unanimously approved th this and that they feel comfortable enough with the stability of our bond rating. That's all I can say. If, if that's what you're looking for is, is some... Sir, first of all, your comment is out of order. And second, I'm trying to respond to a legitimate question by someone who, who uh, you know, has the right to ask his question. But I, I just think that this is becoming a political thing as opposed to a financial thing. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, Tom Amaro, Precinct 7. I, I'm just confused on the 75000 child care fund, does that mean you're taking away from child care, which is very important? I mean, do we have child care in this town? I'm way past child care age kids. But. No, no, no. <laughs> Still think and, it's important. Mr. Moderator, answer the previous speaker's question. Uh, the, the Chumstead Public Schools run a very successful child care program. And it's actually the, the money goes into what's called a revolving fund. So it means that the parents that pay for those services, the money goes into the revolving fund, and then they are able to expend, um, you know, the supplies, services, things that are, all the things that are, all the expenditures that you would normally think are charged that, to that program. Right. But that is a separate program from the regular education that's provided by the Chumsford Public Schools. So in this case, the child care operation is, is housed in the Westlands Community Ed Center. And so uh, the school committee and school administration uh, was very helpful in providing that amount of money from this revolving fund really to help offset the amount that the town would have to borrow for this project, seeing that the child care operation use, will use some of those kitchen facilities. So that was the intent behind it. Okay, thank you there. Uh, another question I have is on uh, slide 69, the purchase of um, three hybrids for 165000 Why not BEVs, battery electric vehicles? You can get three Tesla Ys for 165000 or at the very least, why not plug-in hybrids? Yep. When it, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm told that uh, they they will be electric. Uh, they will be electric vehicles. Um, when this was planned, um, this was planned several months ago, um, and at that time, uh, the thought was that they would be hybrids. Uh, Chumsford is a green community, so we're always striving to try to replace older gas engine vehicles with uh, with more modern uh, fuel efficient vehicles. Right, but you know, but a hybrid still burns gasoline. You're just lowering. They will, yeah. This is, this is actually this is. I, I apologize for this error, the typographical error here. Um, they, it should say electric vehicles and not hybrids. So, oh. Okay. Yep. So I'm told by our facilities director that they will be full, fully electric vehicles. Well, then beautiful. Uh, okay. Last question. On slide 61, the Adams Library generator, um, is it gasoline um, fueled? Mr. Mutter, it's natural Sorry. gas powered. Or it's natural gas, okay. So then the, I, my question would be, was any, is any consideration being given to having a mobile solar and battery type of, um, and you have electric, you have solar panels on the library roof. And so it is technically possible to use those with, with net metering, it goes into the grid and you, can't, and you can't use it when the power goes out for safety reasons, but there are ways to technically implement um, so that you could use the solar from the roof. But if you had the battery backup mobile unit as a generator, it, 
you know, saves. Okay, the sir, are, are you arguing now I'm or sorry. are you asking a question? The question is, what about the possibility of using solar and battery rather than okay. a fossil fuel-based generator? That's the question. Mr. Moderator, I'm going to ask our public works director to address that question. Sure. The um, Adam Library has a very small array. That array was put on through um, Department of Energy Resource money in the first year that we became green. It would not be able to house any part of that. The main reason for the generator going on to the building itself is that we find ourselves with power outages with this building here, which has a full generator, which is used for warming stations, cooling stations, giving people the ability to charge phones and their other devices when they need to. We feel that we need to do the same thing on the other side of town. Mm -hmm. um, years ago, you could have probably gone with a generator and you could have separated your circuits within the building so that you can put on what you want to put on only. The problem with that today, and especially in the Adams Library because of the size of the electrical closet in the room, it's actually cheaper to do a generator that basically is like having two switches, national grid and generator, so that you're getting the whole building. It would cost more money to have to go in and put in approximately six panels stationed throughout the the um, facility itself that would have to be strictly electrical panels for the generator. Okay. Okay. And, and through the Greens community, we tried some years ago to do an islanding project at the McCarthy Middle School. Uh, the proje project was a little too rich for their blood with the fact that we don't have a ton of AC in that building in the off season, meaning the summertime. So there were five projects put aside by communities that year, and we were the lowest one on the list for the payback. But that would have taken the generator out of that building, which we would have repurposed to the library some years ago, and then they would have been doing it from the solar on the roof, which is plenty big in size, two batteries within the building. So we will try again in the future when right. the time comes. Thank you. I think I might have confused by talking about two different things, using the solar panels on the roof versus using a standalone mobile type of generator with solar power, you know, feeding the batteries and, you know, charging them up. And then when there's a power outage, it would just do what the gas power generator does. It's just equivalent, but thank you. Thank you. Hello, this is Andy Sillinch, who um, was, whose children had walked in your school. Well, that's what I want to say briefly, because my soul was, uh, got, was sick, um, you know, so he had to go from one college to another college, and only they went to the one that would take care of him at that time is because we were holding on to them, and um, uh, uh, eventually it was, was, do was done, uh, and I, I think now it's, it, it, it does more of the way you'd want it to. I just wanted... Okay. It really upset me so so much that this what happened that I don't know Ms. how you do it now. How you okay. say that, Mr. Silnis? I'm I'm are are you asking a question or or do you have a point to make regarding the capital budget? That's really what we're focusing on right now. Are you making the same? Are you making my discussion for one reason because it's too big or not? No, no, I, I don't, I, with all due respect, I just don't understand what the point you're trying to make. If, if, I, if I could understand whether you're in well, favor of the capital budget or against the capital budget or an aspect of the capital budget. Did, did you hear part of that when they said they, they make it, they move it around, they make some change? Clearly now. And that's what I wanted 
to know whether that's actually better than it was earlier for, for my son. And besides that, even though if it was doing it now, it, I think it's okay for me to say, this was a real terrible time, and the, the, children, the son had to be taken from here and taken there, not because you took them and said this is the best thing, is after we sat down and, and bust them to him. Although things are no doubt better now. Okay, thank you. Badriu Pilipin, Precinct 5. Uh, Mr. Moderator, through you to the presenter. Um, I wanted to ask a couple of quick questions uh, regarding the sidewalk construction, road improvements. Um, is there a master plan or a long-term plan on where and when, um, what, what the sequence is of sidewalks that are going to be sure. planned for the town or what, uh, um, what's the sequence of it and do you have a long-range plan or is it uh, more like a once every two year you, you build a plan and it comes out and people get to find out when they get to find out or it's there, what's the no uh, norm for that? Mr. Moderator, to answer the previous speaker's question, the. Um what Public Works has done is they have a, they engage the services of an engineering firm as far as the roadways, and the, the engineering firm um, basically looks at the condition of the pavement and rates the roads on a scale so that they can prioritize which roads will be repaved, and it's a pavement management survey. That guides really which roads will be repaved. Um, on the sidewalks, I'm going to ask either our uh, 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 public works director or assistant public works director to comment on the length of the planning for the, for the sidewalks. Thank you, John. Uh, with the sidewalks, we do have a uh, five-year plan. It's on the website. Um, it tends to be longer than five years, uh, depending on funding, obviously. Um, and then occasionally we do get grants. A few years ago, we had a Complete Streets grant. We were able to do the sidewalk on Richardson Road uh, that was planned, as well as some repair. In the past, we've done a lot of new sidewalks. More recently, we have gone to more of a rebuild what we have. You know, as case in point, the Baruch Road sidewalk I spoke of earlier that needs to be rebuilt because it's not an ADA compliance. So we do have a plan. Uh, so a follow-up question, if you may, uh, may be able to answer this. Is there a, a vision of how and where new, um, I, I understand there is ADA compliance uh, retrofits or upgrades to existing sidewalk uh, as one plan. But to connect new parts of the town or other plans, is there a plan? How do you study that uh, as part of this development of this, this capital works program? And does the public have a um, input process that, that comes in, and especially with a five-year range, seven-year range? So I don't think there has been any sort of public input, per se. Uh, on the engineering website, there is the overall map of the town that shows the existing sidewalks, sidewalks under construction, and future sidewalks. And a lot of that is like connectivity. Uh, you know, in the past, we've made the connection uh, Parkhurst Road, Smith Street, Stedman Street, you know, up Dalton Road, North Road, so you have that loop. Uh, there's other loops to consider. We have gaps on Old Westford Road we need to fill in, in, the, in shortly in the future, so um, there is some rhyme or reason to it. Okay, um, thank you. Um, are there current rules in the Chelmsford bylaws or other rules that the police or anybody else um, enforce in terms of bike usage on the sidewalks versus, I've, I've seen some specific bike lanes emerge, and at least on uh, 4 North, um, mm -hmm. on the side of the new bridge that has come in. Uh, are there other rules um, that, are, that govern the usage of bikes, um, bikes uh, bicycles, not bikes, bicycles uh, usages on the sidewalks uh, specifically? I, th that I can't answer. Okay. Um, does the, I think there is a bike um, and um, whatever the committee name is, if you are a member of it, please speak up. <laughs> Just to, uh, there, there's a in, in town volunteer committee for a, a yeah, the, bike and path. Or, uh, do they provide inputs on yep. the uh, specifics of the build out of the uh, uh, master plan or the vision of where the bikes have to come in? Correct. So the bicycle and pedestrian advisory committee. 
they, uh, they have their own master plan that incorporates some of our vision. Uh, I meet with them annually to discuss the work that was done in the past year. Usually it's in March. Uh, and then the upcoming work for the uh, upcoming construction season. Uh, so there is a back and forth with, with them. They have, uh, in their master plan, they have similar sidewalk connectivity as well as uh, promotion of, you know, bicycle facilities, separate bike lanes, things like that. So I don't know if that answers okay. the question. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Moderator, you may start the clock. I have a few comments, uh, not necessarily a debate at this point. Um, one of the things uh, a previous speaker raised, and it ties into something that I think is going to be very important going forward, um, there is an article later on in the citizen petition on, on uh, climate change or climate uh, acceptance or climate change uh, initiative. Um, but many towns have begun planning for active transportation. Active transportation is the removal of cars or other things, but in, in employing or having people walk to town centers or be able to walk to neighboring stores or be able to bike or other aspects. I hope that even though this, this particular year, this sidewalk construction capital project moves along, that the town, appropriate town departments engage town people as well as transportation studies and what the future mobility requirements will be such that there is an ability to connect these bike uh, sidewalks or bike paths or bike uh, uh, sections of the, of the roadway that need to be fortified or created with safe traffic patterns such that we are able to transition into more active transportation or active mobility features that allow for the residents to move within town uh, without excessive use of uh, vehicular traffic or to be able to enjoy it in the seasons appropriate. So I, I, I would strongly urge the requisite departments to consider that going forward in terms of the framework of decision making and to seek public input and long range planning. So with that I would say, I'm, I'm still going to vote for this in a yes fashion, but with a caution or the, at least the uh, request to the appropriate departments and also to the Bike and Pedestrian Advisory Committee to engage and to have uh, the community members be able to participate in advocating for certain sections of useful connect uh, connections where people will likely, most likely use it. Thank you. Thank you. Jerry, Jerry, Precinct mm -hmm. 6. I have a, a few questions. And one of my questions is, is how much is in the child care revolving fund? Mr. Monterey, the answer to that is approximately 1.2 million. I also um, have the question, to my knowledge, from years ago, when we were talking about uh, repairs at the Westland School, when it was used as it's currently being used, as, or the daycare was being run from there, that, that all that funding had to be used in that school. Is, is that still true? Yes. The child care operation is, is run out of the Westlands Community Ed yes. Center, so I think that's what and you're referring to. the CHIPS program. So that's not considered the CHIPS program, that's the child care program, okay. is that correct? Ms. Derry, we're, we're really focusing on the capital budget, not the uh, operational budget. All right, then why cannot the child care, if they have 1.2 million, do we have to borrow money to do the kitchen? Well, well, uh, well, 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 no, no. Capital, capital funding is, is used for specific purposes in which you're borrowing money for uh, goods or services that are long term, like trucks or um, uh, sidewalks or things like that, not, not for programs. All right, Mr. Curl, and I do have another question. According to the book, there's 76. CHIPS students. How many students are in the daycare? Okay, that, that again, that has nothing to do with the capital budget. Well, I guess I would like to know who's using the kitchen. No. Well. The CHIPS students do not stay there all day, if I'm correct. I, I just, if, if you want to ask them why they need a kitchen, that's a, that's a legitimate well, question. I, I, but I also want to know why they can't pay for it all, and we have to pay for it. 
Mr. Moderator, to it, that, that came up during a discussion in a capital planning committee meeting. And as the a, as a superintendent of schools explained, uh, that was, uh, they came up with that, that number is based on a formula uh, because the child care program only uses a portion of the school and does not make up all the students. So um, I could ask Dr. Ling to explain that in more detail, but he, he, they did uh, do an analysis of that and that was the amount, that was determined as the amount based on a formula that could be used to fund the kitchen. So the one, how will, one last question. How will the $1.2 million ever be used towards the Western School? Mr. Moderator, answer, answer the previous speaker's question. Uh, that revolving fund um, is not just for capital, it's to, it's to um, fund a lot of the childcare op operations, uh, you know, staff, expenditures. Right, it's a revolving uh, fund. I understand. And so out of that fund, it all, they're all getting paid from that particular fund. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, as your local audio man, I know you all get very excited about these things, but if you could talk into the microphones, you'll make my life a lot easier, and then your peers will actually hear what you're saying. Thank you. <laughs> good, e good evening, Mr. Hollerad. Jim Lane, Precinct 7. Uh, just, just a couple of quick questions, John. Um, with regards to the, um, the, the CCA, money. Um, I understand the safety grates and the, uh, the additional ladders, but the insulation, this was just renovated with CPA funds 10 years ago, 11 years ago. Was it not insulated at that time? I, I like, Mr. Munter, I'd like to ask our uh, public works director to address that. The attic was insulated at the time. What has happened is the room is so large, as you're well aware, the air comes from up above and down, and the grates and the returns are very close to, to the ceilings where they are. They, the, by being a historic building, number one, they were not gonna drop things down to the floor level, which is what, or lower, which is what tries to be done these days as well. So what we had done is we had done some envelope surveys of buildings and, and we did them to fire stations as well and started doing insulation, door sweeps, all of that as part of it. And during that renovation, it was told that if we were to do that, we would increase the heat into that area because we'd be taking some of the coal that's coming in out. So it's, a, it's added insulation to it. Is it just the ceiling? It's in the ceiling and along the ductwork. So it'll be the, the uh, walls to the side of it and the, the uh, rafters up above, yes. Okay, and last question I have is related to, um, you know, this is all new installation. Does it not qualify for CPA funds? Why are we taking this out of capital and not approaching CPA for it? The building was renovated with CPA funds, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Right? Mr. Moderator, um, my understanding is um, community preservation funds, community, this, the previous speaker is correct, community preservation funds were used to renovate the building. Um, community, there are some restrictions on community preservation fund use. Um, they tend not to fund uh, like maintenance type things um, and, and some other restrictions. So I think we just thought it was a appropriate use of capital to try to upgrade that and uh, going forward it should, um, you know, it should provide some uh, utility savings. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Moderator, Ginger Skook, Precinct 6. Um, one final question for our, the speaker. Um, on the sidewalk construction again, my apologies. Um, do 
the school committee have any input into the planning for the sidewalks? You've already mentioned to the previous speaker that the bicycle and pedestrian committee are consulted as part of that master plan. Sort of talking with the public works director whether he or I should answer the question because we're both familiar with it. The town's sidewalk improvement plan for the last 15 plus years has primarily focused on school pathways and, and sidewalks and school safety because of the concerns of children walkers. Um, we, we think we've addressed those concerns for the most part and now we're, we're sort of going towards other areas as well as maintaining the handicapped accessibility uh, of the existing sidewalks that are in the town as well as the uh, trying to address the uh, business community uh, needs. But I think the thing that's being missed in this debate is we're, we're adding our funding to this because the bottom line is the state hasn't adjusted the funding that's come to the cities and towns in over eight years in terms of what you pay when you go to the, to the gas station and pay in gas tax to the Commonwealth. Right now, the, the estimates from the Municipal Association statewide is the funding level that for adequate maintenance of roadways and sidewalks in the Commonwealth are being funded through the gas tax at probably about a 30 to 50 percent funding level. So the bottom line is we're, we're not even able to tread water. Um, and of course, there's a resistance by the legislature to raise the gas tax because when they tried to index it to inflation, that got repealed by the voters. Uh, and you're also now hearing similar debate at the federal level about the federal gas tax, which hasn't changed since like 1996 or something. But the come back to your question is, we don't have adequate funding. We're supplementing it with our capital funding. And it may be something that we return to in the fall when we have our free cash certified and whether we want to use our cash reserves to put additional funding into our roads and sidewalks. But fundamentally, yes, the focus of the community has been on school safety and providing safe routes to schools uh, through our capital uh, plan for sidewalk improvement. Mr. Moderator, you may start the clock again. Mr. Code, I appreciate your commentary there. However, um, your DPW just said that they were going to use $350,000 of the capital budget to replace bricks into the center of town. The number of children who live in the center of town versus the number of children who live within a one mile radius of their school and cannot walk, therefore we have to pay for transportation or transport them ourselves, those two things don't wash. Regardless of whether or not the money is coming in, it doesn't sound like you have prioritized the historical vision and the operational issues of parents and the schools. I get that you've done this, the sidewalks around the schools. I was for it. I was for the spending the money on the sidewalk plowing thing. North Road is great. I live at the top of Dalton Road, Westford Street, and Skyview Drive. My children cannot walk to center school. My children cannot bike to center school because Westford Street and Dalton Road are one, too narrow, two, people in this town refuse to slow down. And the way that those roads curve even for drivers, there are issues with the way that that road is. And to hear that one DPW isn't, doesn't have some sort of forum for community input, especially after the year we just had. One minute. That the bicycle pedestrian committee hasn't made this point and that maybe or maybe not the school committee is, is bringing this in because that was really my question. I don't find your answer to actually track. Yes, the state's not giving us enough money, then let's use the money better. Thank you. Thank you.
Brian Latina, Precinct 4. Uh, question on sidewalk construction. We mentioned that we're, we're doing an ADA compliant, um, I'm going to say north end of, of Route 129. I'm going to call that, I guess that's Bill Ricca Road as well. Um, will that construction, you said it was ADA compliant. The other end of Bill Ricca Road, all the way up to the Bill Ricca Road line, I believe is somewhat ADA compliant except all winter. Um, it has never been cleared of snow. The sidewalks are never cleared. In fact, I have some nice pictures this year of the um, ADA compliant button with the blind ramp being under the snow banks, actually under it. Will this new $170,000 expenditure of the sidewalk snow equipment be used to clear the sidewalk during the nine months or so that we have snow or potential snow? And will you please clear the um, end that has now 108 um, units um, so that they can walk the sidewalk from the former handicap school there around the circle, across the Route 3 exit and entrance ramps on the handicap sidewalk, and all the way up to the Bill Ricker line and to our, our um, Chelmsford Forum. Will that sidewalk plow be used for that? It's never been cleared. Through you, Mr. Moderator, to the previous speaker and to the town meeting body. The answer to your question is no, and I'll explain why. We have 230 road miles in the community. The DPW and I and the administration and I bet the select board and finance committee, we'd like to construct sidewalks in every roadway in the community. And we would like to remove snow from every sidewalk in the community as well as the roadways in the community. The problem is, like anything else, we have limited resources. And how it works, and we've explained this at previous town meetings, at select board meetings and other forums, is the first function during snow and ice removal situations is to maintain the roads for safe passage for emergency public travel purposes. So therefore, during the course of a snowstorm, that if an ambulance or a fire apparatus or a police vehicle or what have you needed to arrive at your home, that hopefully we can do the de-icing and snow removal operations to provide safe passage and, and safe occupancy of your residence. Once the storm has passed, the DPW has a cycle with its employees to remove snow removal operations uh, on the sidewalks. And we do use the, our snow uh, our removal equipment, our sidewalk plows, to do that. And yes, it radiates out from the school, school routes. So therefore, again, because we know and we share the concerns with, with children who walk to school. And, and, and it, yes, it is the priority of the school department as well. So that's where they begin, so that the roadways can be cleared for, for the children who are walking to school, as well as others who walk on the existing sidewalks that we have on North Road, Chelmsford Street, and Barricka Road, as you noted. But what happens in reality is, is oftentimes there are winter conditions where you haven't even cleaned up the three or four days it takes to do the sidewalks, and then another storm comes or another icing or removal situation comes and then you're backlogged. And, and we've seen this happen in reality. So short of increasing the personnel staffing in the DPW operations, uh, I, I'm not gonna sit here and assure you that we're gonna be able to do a better job with the new piece of equipment than if we didn't have the piece of equipment because of the fact, as we noted, we're doing level staffing and level service. Uh, again, it's not the level of service that we all would aspire to, but it's the level of service given the resources that we have, given the constraints that we have in terms of the property tax, and given the inadequate funding from the state, not only in the Chapter 90 road and sidewalk constructing funds, but in state aid that, that, it, that, that again, increasingly falls, as I mentioned at the beginning of my comments this evening, we're a minimum community from the state in terms of state aid, and, and therefore what happens is we're shouldering more of the burden annually by the property tax, and we understand there are constraints on what people can pay under the property tax. So the, so, so the short answer is, is no. We're not going to assure you that we're going to be out by the Barricka Town line clearing sidewalks on the area in, in an area that doesn't have as many pedestrians, uh, particularly children walking, to assure you that that's going to be cleared fully ADA accessible within a two or three day period. Um, you can start the clock. Mr. Moderator, I'm not asking for a two or three day period. I'm talking, I've seen that sideway and sidewalk along that section of road cleared one time in the last 12 years. It took 12 years to paint the line crossing the bridge on 129. 
This, this area is our last rescue for attracting businesses. Finally convinced the um, gentlemen that were cutting trees down on the, on the off-ramp to cut 30 feet in so that we could actually drive along that without having the trees hit our cars. Those white and yellow lines that keep you from going the wrong way on the highway, people do that, um, have never been painted to my experience on 129. And as you come around on the inside curve, those, that brush on that inside curve coming Route 3 northbound onto 129 into the 65 acres that we want to attract businesses looks like I'm in left field someplace out in the western part of the state. It does not look like a place I would want to put a business. And to hear that we will not clear the sidewalk and the ADA compliant push buttons and the, and the handicap ramps makes me wonder why in the world they're there in the first place. Snow removal never happens there by Chelmsford. Snow removal never happens there by the state of Massachusetts. I've challenged both to do it. We need our lines painted by the state. We need those roads cleared so that you can actually drive along there. And if somebody ever stops on the inside curve on either one of those, they will be hit. There are lots of accidents in that section. And I hesitate. We'll, we'll be back in here fixing those when somebody's killed on that sidewalk. Thank you. Okay, um, we do have an amendment by uh, 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 Town Meeting Representative Rand uh, to the capital budget, and we have to address that first. The um, amendment is on the screen before you in which he wishes to delete the $145,000 um, uh, uh, line item for the Adams Library generator. So if people want to talk about that, we can do that. If people don't, we can vote on that. So we're going to talk about it. <laughs> Excuse me, Will Wagner, Precinct 8. Uh, I'd just like to say that I think that the Adams Library, you can start the clock. Uh, I think that the Adams Library generator uh, is a piece of foresight by the town looking forward to potential uh, need in the case of a long-term outage, uh, as stated for a cooling zone or a warming zone, uh, in addition to supporting the library as necessary. And uh, I disagree with removing this line item. I think this is an important thing for the future of the town. Thank you. Thank you. Glenn Thorne, Precinct 5, you can start the clock. I uh, agree with the previous speaker because in order to have a place in town like the Senior Center and like Adams Library will be with this generator for things as simple as, again, if you're without power, being able to recharge your phones, being able to have a place that's either cooled in the summer or warm in the winter is a smart thing to do. Leaving a building that's that useful without power in times of an emergency makes no sense to me, so I'm going to vote against this amendment. Thank you. Okay. So, let's vote on the amendment. A yes vote is to delete the funds from the uh, capital budget. A no vote is not to. The amendment has failed, 12 in favor, 122 opposed, one abstention. And now we will vote on the capital budget as originally presented. This does require a two-thirds vote. It's been an interesting, this is Kelly Beatty for Chancellor Telemedia, uh, commenting that it's been an interesting quirk of the budgeting process here in the town of Chelmsford for the last few years. 
that the capital budget amounting approximately to $4 million has drawn a remarkable amount of debate and, and uh, second guessing um, over many items that are carefully considered and, and put forward. That's not to say that mistakes can't be made. The article passes 124 in favor, 11 opposed, one abstention. We now jump to Article 10. By considering that At 10 o'clock, the, the uh, school budget and town budget totally Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Article 10 is a request to transfer $275,000 uh, from the Finance Committee's Reserve Fund for the current fiscal year. It is just an interesting. Relating to the PFAS uh, situation at the former DPW I'm, facility headquarters, now DPW Yard, at 54 Richardson Road. And for the past several months, we've, we've contracted with an engineering firm after it was detected in the uh, monitoring well samples that we had elevated levels of per and polyfluoro alkyl substances or PFAS or the forever chemical as you may have come across in, in media. Um, and so we've engaged with an engineering firm, we've done additional uh, placement of monitoring wells, uh, have amended the plan based on the initial reports that have come back. Um, the concern here um, is that the PFAS materials may be migrating towards the adjacent North Chelmsford Water District public water supply wells. Um, and therefore, you know, we've been working with the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection um, on, on an approved, what they call an immediate response action plan or in, in terms of what work needs to be done, the sampling that's gone out there. Um, since the time of our initial findings, the select board requested we do an entire scan of the site. That is in progress as well. Um, the deadline by the state to complete this assessment is October 11th, and we will meet that deadline, um, and therefore we need funding for this purpose. Um, and in terms of the issue of cost, one of the things that the select board is looking to explore is the possibility of joining in class action litigation uh, that is in, in effect out there that the two water districts have already signed on for in an effort to potentially perhaps recover the expenditures uh, by the community at a later date to not only do this analysis but to do whatever treatment and other efforts are needed uh, in, in, in ahead of us. So that's the presentation under this article, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Does the Finance Committee have a recommendation? The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 10. Does the select board have a recommendation? The majority of the select board recommends approval of Article 10 with four in favor and one abstention. Thank you. Any questions or discussion? Alvin Drain, Precinct 5. Well, you're speaking into the microphone, so that's good. <laughs> I hope that Bill Ricker, everyone in Bill Ricker heard that. <laughs> uh, you just mentioned a class action suit. Again, I'm just the question against uh, who? Oh, through you, Mr. Moderator, against the manufacturers uh, of these type of, of materials. Um, you may recall in early generations the asbestos litigation and class action efforts, and then there's also an ongoing opioid effort against opioid manufacturers. Now there, there is an effort in terms of the manufacturers of the PFAS materials to see if there's a means of which to recover some of the costs um, for the impact it's having on the environment. And if you've seen any of the research on this, this PFAS is widespread up the East Coast in the industrial Midwest as well as in California. Uh, it's even detected now in, in, in rainwater. Um, and so it's, it's a, uh, a known crisis. Um, and again, there's no, there's no cost to the town if we were to join such litigation. Basically how these class action litigation works is they, the attorneys get about a third of the cut of the settlement uh, from that and then the others are distributed um, you know, usually by population or other impact to the community. Uh, Glenn Thorne, Precinct 5. Two quick questions, if I may. Um, the wells in North Chelmsford are being continually tested for the presence of this material, I assume? 
uh, yes, all, all water. The Commonwealth requires all public water supplies for test for, to test for PFAS, and also selected private individual wells in certain areas of the Commonwealth also have to be tested for PFAS. I, I've heard of the material, but I haven't heard of a town well emergency where the uh, the percentage of that material has exceeded uh, what's ex what's expected. Uh, do we have such an emergency? Right now, it has not. The, right now, the water supply in Chelmsford has not exceeded the threshold levels. There are other communities in the Commonwealth where they're distributing bottled water and, and such, and have shut down wells. Uh, certain wells in certain towns as a result of the PFAS levels. Um, so we're, we're hoping that's not the case, but again, we're also, what's being tested here is a town property. As, as I noted earlier, there are a variety of sources that contribute towards PFAS contamination, um, and, but we're, we're doing what's responsible under our watch. But at this point, right now in the town of Chelmsford, we're assured by the water districts that the water is safe to drink, uh, but this is something that everyone is keeping an eye on. So one last question, has the state uh, proposed, considered, offered any funding to assist the town in dealing with this? Right now, the state funding level is limited to those communities that are exceeding the threshold for PFAS. So right now, we would not qualify under the current state funding program. Again, that could and change. And I hope we that never do. That could change. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Mr. Moderator, Brian Latina, Precinct 4. Um, through you to the, to the speaker, or maybe somebody more technical than me, my understanding is that this stuff is also present in Teflon tape that every plumber in the world and most residents have wrapped their threads of copper pipes and everything else in. Is, is there a possible um, contamination of that Teflon tape we all have on our, on our uh, different washers and dryers and such? and possibly, more importantly, on the new wells that they put in. Did they, I assume they have pipes in there, did they wrap the pipes with that or plumber's putty with, with PFAS in it so the, the levels may be exceeding what's really in the water? Through you, Mr. Moderator. Um, yes. That, that concern was addressed in the monitoring uh, and sampling that's gone on in the, in, in the investigation. The levels that are there, and it, it's been ruled out is a simple answer, that's been ruled out. That's not what's taking place here. It's not side contamination. There, there are, and, and again, you know, th these are materials that we don't know how long they've been in the groundwater um, and, and also in, the, uh, in soils and other activities. This is not from, con from current activities or probably activities within the last couple of decades, but you've got a site there that's, that's been a DPW yard probably since the 1950s. And during the course of the investigation, we've unearthed a, a number of disturbing things. We, we've unearthed uh, a, uh, a groundwater, uh, oil water separator that was buried basically and covered over by bituminous concrete decades ago. We also found uh, containers of, of hydraulic fluid that were buried in the soils in the back through the scans and so forth. One was from a former truck body and so forth. So basically, we, we know it goes beyond just something as inadvertent as that, as a, oh, you're, you're getting cross-contamination from, you know, from tape or other, or, or, or other aspects uh, of, you know, that could be a, 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 an easily achievable source. And it's just unfortunate, and, and as I said, there are a number of properties in that area as well as you know, across the town, across the state, across the country, um, where unfortunately the environmental practices that we use today certainly weren't what was done decades ago. Um, and even in the case of, for example, firefighting foam used to contain PFAS materials, um, firefighting gear and so forth has, you know, those are the type of things that over time, and even when they would spray the snow plows, you know, for, for the, you know, to, to prevent, make sure that they're, you know, not adhering and so forth in terms of the snow materials, those contain PFAS materials. So it's been a variety of sources. And again, the threshold levels are, are, are health concerns, which is why what drives all this, but the contamination levels are, you know, they, they describe it as drops of water in Olympic-sized pools um, to give you the level of what can, can creates a health concern. And our current DPW yard is actually in a wetlands. I know it's raised up a bit. 
Has the practice, um, we've learned obviously from the practice of the other DPW yard, not to put contaminants there, but I did notice there were, there were piles of asphalt and tires and things like that. Um, can we avoid that? I know it's probably not PFAS stuff, but um, are you speaking it's right of, there at the salt of, shed. Are you speaking of Alpha Road or at Richardson the Road? New one, the, the new one. The Alpha Road? Yeah. 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 Bring the asphalt to the asphalt plant instead. Right. That's all I have on PFAS. Yeah. Thank you. Hello, uh, Kevin Gasilla from Precinct 2. Um, I was just wondering about the extent of this uh, study. Um, hopefully it doesn't say that bad, but if we get bad news from it, is it going to include um, mitigation uh, uh, methods for uh, North Chelmsford Wells, or are we just paying for where we're at right now, and then we'll have to go for, for, forward from there? We'll, we'll know better after the assessment is completed, but, but there, that may result, there may be a, a mitigation or a cleanup requirement. We just don't know at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? None? Okay, we're going to vote on Article 10. This requires a two-thirds vote to uh, appropriate $275,000 from the Fiscal Year 2021 Finance Committee Reserve Fund to investigate uh, and report and remediate perhaps uh, PFAS on Richardson Road. Our, in our life, uh, anytime you have a situation like this where something has permeated your water supply, it gets the immediate attention of everyone involved including, as you can tell from the discussion, the town me meeting representatives here tonight. As the article to passes that, unanimously, 136 in favor, no uh, opposed or abstentions. It's a unanimous vote. Article 11, and fortunately it is not 11 o'clock. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. <laughs> article 11 is the fiscal year 2022 sewer enterprise operating budget. Again, remember, the operating budget means that the Expenses and revenues stay within a separately contained fund. So, i.e., what you pay in your sewer bill stays in, and does not fund anything other than the expenses for the sewer operations. You can see the budget request for, the, for this year totals $4.4 million, of which about $1.2 million is personnel and $3.2 million is for expenses. Um, and again, it all comes from sewer enterprise revenues. Um, this is a significant increase. Uh, of over 11 percent of $440,000 for the upcoming fiscal year. Um, what's really driving half of this is the assessment from the Lowell Regional Wastewater Facility. We have a $200,000 increase, and what's driving that increase is sort of what we heard earlier this evening regarding solid waste disposal. They're running into an expensive market, as you can see, on sludge disposal that their cost to dispose of the sludge that comes out of the plant is rising from $85 per ton to $120 per ton. And they also have to undertake capital improvements to this facility that was built in the 1970s. Um, so unfortunately, as, as a result of this, we, we've gone over five years without a rate increase in the, in the um, sewer fees in the community. That run has come to an end, unfortunately, and rather significantly at this point in time. Um, and so, you know, th this is the budget again. It's, we're not adding any staffing in the sewer enterprise. We're just, we're just sort of maintaining the costs that, that are related to the charges from the city of Lowell as well as our consulting and operational charges to run, the, to run our sewer pump stations and, and sewer lines throughout the community. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Does the Finance Committee have a recommendation? The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 11. Does the Select Board have a recommendation? The Select Board unanimously recommends approval of Article 11. Okay. Any questions? Discussion? Apparently not. Okay. We will vote on Article 11 to uh, uh, appropriate $4,384,397 to the Sewer Enterprise Fund budget.
Article passes unanimously, 127 in favor, no opposed, and no abstentions. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Article 12 is a request for an appropriation of $485,000 for the purchase of a vacuum truck for the Public Works Sewer Division, and this will be borrowed in the debt service for the uh, pur purchase of this vehicle would be paid again through the Town Sewer Enterprise Fund. This, is re this, this vacuum truck has water tanks, flush lines, heated water capacities, and basically it's used to resolve sewage blockage and backup problems. It replaces a current sewer vacuum truck that is a 2010 model and is at the end of its useful life. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Does the Finance Committee have a recommendation? The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 12. Does the Select Board have a recommendation? The Select Board unanimously recommends approval of Article 12. Any discussion or questions? Claire Janot, Precinct 7. My question, I'm not sure who it should be addressed to, perhaps the town manager or the finance committee, I don't know. But this seems to be a fairly hefty capital item, and I don't understand why things like this aren't built in as part of the capital planning process. Why are we seeing separate articles for various capital? Oh, I, I think the, the through you, Mr. Moderator, the answer is, is because the capital budget of the town is paid for from the property tax levy. The capital for sewer and stormwater are paid through the enterprise funds, meaning they are paid from sewer revenues. So basically what we're trying to do is capture the entire cost of running the sewer operations and treatment facility through the sewer revenues, um, and therefore we would not fund this through the town's capital budget. Uh, but we do have a multi-year sewer capital plan, um, so that's, that's the distinction. That's why it's not okay, wrapped Okay, so this into. was in that capital yes. plan? Yes. Okay, thank you. Along with pump stations and other facilities, exactly, yes. Mary France, Precinct 6. Um, my question is, is the debt service for this particular item included in the debt service line item in the budget we just approved? Yes, it's our, it, yeah, we, we've factored that in because we had to make an estimate. I noticed there was a right. significant increase in the but, debt service budget for this right, year. Right, exactly. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, then we will vote on Article 12. Appropriation of $485,000 for the purchase of a vacuum truck. You might wonder why a truck would cost almost half a million dollars. This is a special model. I understand it goes from zero to 60 in 8.7 seconds. The article passes 129 in favor, one opposed, no abstentions. Article 13. Yeah, again, Article 13 is a, another vehicle for the sewer enterprise and sewer division. This is a $60,000 vehicle for the purchase of a utility truck. Um, and again, it, the debt service on this would be paid for from the enterprise. It's, it replaces a vehicle that was uh, manufactured in the year 2011. It has 164,000 miles on it with serious body rot uh, and front end work required. Uh, and again, this vehicle is used not only for the sewer operations, but it is employed in the town's snow removal operations. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Does the Finance Committee have a recommendation? The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 13. Does the Select Board have a recommendation? The Select Board unanimously recommends approval of Article 13. Any questions? Discussion? All right, this requires a two-thirds vote to appropriate uh, $60,000 for a utility truck for the DPW Sewer Division.
Article passes 123 in favor, two opposed, no abstentions. Article 14. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Article 14 is the Stormwater Management Enterprise Fund. This is a request, as you can see, for $1.5 million, roughly half on personnel and half on expenses. This upcoming fiscal year budget is the third and final phase of the implementation of the stormwater management program in accordance with the federal and state requirements to, to protect and, and clarify and test and, and preserve the quality of groundwater. Uh, as I noted, those federal regulations became effective three years ago. Um, the town has a significant um, stormwater management responsibility with over 95 miles of, of drains, 4,500 catch basins, 600 drainage outlets, 210 culverts, and 50 detention ponds. And we're required under the federal and state programs to sample our drainage outflows at least twice a year. We have to clean our catch basins, and we have to perform street sweeping twice per year to protect the 30 miles of stream across our community. So again, this is the, the third and final phase of this program, which would, would then um, you know, help us move forward in, in, in part of the environmental efforts to maintain the quality of groundwater and protect the environment. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Does the Finance Committee have a recommendation? The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 14. Does the Select Board have a recommendation? The Select Board unanimously recommends approval of Article 14. Any questions? There being none, we will vote on Article. Up. Oh. You snooze, you lose. <laughs> I'm in the, in the front row of the movie theater. It's kind of just such a joy there. Uh, Kathy Tabby, Precinct One. Um, I think I'm reading something wrong. Sure. It looks like we have two new laborers, and that's going to cost us. $724,000, or is that the total number? That's the, that's the entire budget. Okay, thank you. That's the entire budget. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. We're going to vote on Article 14 for a $1.5 million proposed but sto uh, fiscal 2022 stormwater management enterprise fund budget. This is a, a new component of our annual budgeting process. A couple of years ago, the Environmental Protection Agency uh, essentially mandated that our town uh, take these precautions to preserve, uh, to, to make sure that the stormwater going down our drains is as unpolluted as possible. And uh, satisfying that EPA mandate uh, required the town to essentially build a whole Article new Article passes department. 127 in favor, one opposed, no abstentions. And you're seeing the consequences. Thank you, Mr. Now. Moderator. Article 15 is a stormwater project. Um, we're seeking a $500,000 uh, appropriation to replace the stormwater culverts on Dunshire Drive um, at Deep Brook. And again, this would be borrowed and, and paid for through the debt service for the budget that you just approved for the stormwater. The history on this project is, is um, about 18 months ago, the town was awarded an $83,000 grant under the state's municipal vulnerability preparedness program for the uh, phase one, which is basically the geotechnical assessment, modeling, site design, and permitting. That work has been completed. We've applied for the funding to do the entire project, which is $673,000. However, to date, the town has not received grant funding for the construction of this project. So, but however, it is a known flood area that's in deterioration, and you said we've done the design and it qualified under the program. So we are seeking this appropriation to fund the portion of the roadway culvert uh, of this project uh, as a flood control measure uh, in, on the Dunshaw Deep Brook area. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Finance Committee have a recommendation. The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 15. Select Board have a recommendation. The Select Board unanimously recommends approval of Article 15. Any questions? Uh, Scott Davidson, Precinct 3. So we're, we're asking for $500,000, so will there still be work to do after we... It, 
the grant yeah. was for 673, so I assume there'll still be some work left. Exactly, which okay. we may come back at a later date, and or we're continuing to pursue grant funding for this project. But at this point, we really want to address the flood risk that's there for those residents. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Let's vote on Article 15. This requires a two-thirds vote, $500,000 for the replacement of stormwater culverts on Dunshire Drive. Uh, Kelly Beatty again, as has been pointed out by the town manager and the, uh, the DPW manager, ours is a town with a lot of Almost. roadways, um, a mileage of roadways. We are very spread out. And it's only with these last series of articles that you begin to appreciate how complex a process it is to maintain all of that. Mm -hmm. Not just the repaving and, and such, the striping, but what goes on underneath those roads as well. Article passes unanimously, 130 in favor. Article 16. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Article 16 is a request for an appropriation of $435,000 for the purchase of a vacuum truck for the stormwater division. And again, this will be borrowed and paid for from the uh, stormwater enterprise. This is a different type of truck. Um, this is a catch basin cleaner and hydro you know, excavation set that used for cleaning culverts, catch basins, oil separators, and so forth. For sanitary and health purposes, we can't use the same vehicle for stormwater purposes as you would for sanitary, but it's also a totally different design component truck. So they have the same generic name of a vacuum truck, but they're different construction, different components, and for obvious sanitary reasons, even if they were the same, you couldn't use them anyway. So that's the request under this article, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, uh, Mr. Manager. Uh, does the Finance Committee have a recommendation? The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 16. And does the Select Board have a recommendation? The Select Board unanimously recommends approval of Article 16. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Doug Bruce, Precinct 9. No need to start the clock. I'm going to be very brief. Uh, first off, I'm going to vote for this like I voted for the last sucker truck. But I would just like to take this opportunity to encourage anybody that's spending money in town, when we're spending money on vehicles that have low, low usage or low duty cycles, I encourage us to participate in regional organizations like MCOG or look for partnerships amongst other towns. We're all in the same uh, stormwater or sewer situation. Uh, I was going to say something else. We're up a creek without a sucker truck. But I'd just like to encourage us to seek out partnerships for large capital expenditures where these things aren't always, they're not used every day. That's the only point I wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, this requires a two-thirds vote uh, to, to purchase uh, a vacuum truck for the DPW, $435,000. The article passes 123 uh, in favor, four opposed, no abstentions. Now, uh, by virtue of the consent agenda, we are jumping from number 16 to number 25. Am I yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Article 25 is the annual Community Preservation Fund uh, but Warren article, and um, Linda Prescott, the chair, has asked me to present on behalf of the Preservation Committee. Um, basically, what, what's taking place under this article is, is we appropriate funds as required, the 10% allocation under the Community Preservation State Statute, and then we also set aside $50,000 for the administrative expenses of the committee, um, as, as well as the uh, required funding for the debt service of the project. So. In summary, working with the town accountant and the committee, um, 
we, we estimate our revenues for the upcoming year to be 1.6 million, of which 1.3 million of that comes from the property tax surcharge, and the state match at this point is estimated to be $345,000. Um, again, we have to set aside the 10% allocation, but when we set that aside, we then immediately follow as part of this motion to then apply that allocation towards the debt service, so that then frees up the balance of, the, of that revenue estimate to be used for any purpose at a future town meeting. Um, here's our existing debt service under community preservation that we need to fund for previously approved projects. You can see the Sheehan Farm project, we're nearing the end of the debt service cycle on that one. That, that, that's what the two 2023 indicates. So the debt service as we, we're rolling it out, because remember we pay level principal, which means that unlike a home mortgage, it declines over time because you're paying off principal and then your interest costs are, are, are less. Um, so again, the Sheehan Farm's going down. You can see there's minor costs for the Varney Playground project. Roberts Field, and then obviously the most recent one being the Warren Pole property um, back in um, last summer, which has a 10-year period. You can see it at 2031. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Finance Committee have a recommendation. The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 25. Does the Select Board have a recommendation? The Select Board unanimously recommends approval of Article 25. Any questions? Tom Amaro, Precinct 7. Just a real quick one. Where was Chelmsford Woods? I, I thought I knew every trail. That, that, no, that's, that's, a, that's an affordable housing project on Littleton Road, right next to the gas station across from the mobile oh. home park that David Hedison and the Housing, housing Authority Choice constructed. I'm thinking Woods. I'm thinking <laughs> The Woods are the trees in front of the project. Right. <laughs> Okay, apparently no one else has any uh, questions. Uh, let's vote on uh, Article The article passes 129 in favor, one opposed, no abstentions. Article 26. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Article 26 is a community preservation approved project to appropriate $330,000 from the Community Preservation Fund General Reserve for the purchase and installation of new playground equipment at Varney Playground in Southwell Park. Um, the Varney Playground equipment was constructed over 20 years ago and is of wood construction and it's at the end of its useful life and also the ADA or compliance and safety codes have obviously changed in that 20 year period. So the proposal is to purchase new playground equipment uh, and have the area be fully compliant to provide full accessibility for all children. Uh, and similarly, the Southwell field, which is a much smaller playground area, is also in the, at the end of its useful life where it can be used safely. So we, we respectfully ask for your funding to uh, undertake these two projects. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Does the Finance Committee have a recommendation? The Finance Committee, the finance committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 26. Does the Select Board have a recommendation? The Select Board unanimously recommends approval of Article 26. Any questions? Okay, let's vote on Article 26. The article passes 129 in favor, two opposed, no abstentions. Article 27. 
Article 27 is a community preservation fund project really submitted by the Conservation Commission. And I'm going to invite up to the podium Dave McLaughlin, who up until Tuesday night was the chair of the Conservation Commission, but is still continuing on the commission, uh, to present under this article to explain the request regarding the Warren Pole property. But as Dave's coming, I also want to note, I know David also wants the town meeting to recognize the uh, recent passing of Bobby Greenwood, who, who spent decades on the Conservation Commission, uh, as well as previously serving on the Board of Health and, and you know, a, a war veteran and other aspects of our community. So with that, uh, David. Yeah, uh, just to remind you, Bobby was on the Conservation Commission for 30 years. It's, it's remarkable that somebody in town can work that long, in a very quiet way, very unassuming, for 30 years helping the town. So, uh, We're requesting uh, $30,000 to begin the build-out of uh, the Warren Pole Farm that the town acquired last year at town meeting. And, the, and this project is to construct parking so that uh, the uh, reservation can begin to be used. It's also going to be used to, uh, we're going to, the parking will be for 18 cars and will uh, accommodate handicapped people as well. Uh, we need the funds to begin to purchase signage for the trail system that will be out there uh, to do some legal work to draft a conservation restriction which will be held by an independent third party, and, uh, and finally to survey part of the site. That's a $30,000 project. I think you all know where the Warren Pole Farm is, but just to refresh your memory, it's a 56-acre parcel that's off Boston Road between Acton Road, Hall Road, and Bartlett Street. This is a picture of the parking lot that we're proposing to do will not be paved. It will be made of gravel. Uh, there will be signage uh, appropriate, and there will be fire gates to allow uh, emergency entrance to the, uh, to the, to the uh, Warren Pole Reservation. So thank you. Thank you. Does the Finance Committee have a recommendation? The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 27. Does the Select Board have a recommendation? The Select Board unanimously recommends approval of Article 27. Phil Stanway, Precinct 7. I have a couple questions. The first is, was a mention about a conservation restriction. Um, is this new or different than the one that's currently in work with the Land Conservation Trust, the second one? Okay, let's, let's do one at a time, and who's going to answer that question? Who's, is, apparently uh, there's a, a, a present, a current conservation? Uh, yeah, the, the uh, what was just said is that some of the money is going to be used for conservation restriction. Right. The, the um, Conservation Commission is in negotiations with the Chelmsford Land Conservation Trust, of which Phil is a member, uh, in an effort to, to achieve agreement on language for a conservation restriction. And so, yes, some of the monies in this would, would be used to cover the costs uh, incurred for basically legal services. Um, we've, we've performed some survey work by the DPW staff engineer, uh, 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 surveyor and so forth, but yes, some of this, is, as, as was noted by, by Dave McLaughlin, uh, will be used to uh, cover those costs. Um, uh, second question, do we have a plan of what this contains? Uh, how wide the road is going to be, what the material is going to be, is there going to be a swale, is it going to be drainage, is it going to be runoff? I just think 30,000 is real low if you're going to take um, the funds out for the um, conservation restriction. My understanding is, is that the DPW has worked with, with Dave McLaughlin, Conservation Commission, Carl Bischoff, in the design of the area as well as the cost estimate. So my understanding is the funding is adequate, is will, the, be ad, will be adequate. Uh, one other question. Um, if there was a designed one, is there any reason it's not included in this plan? The design, any type of basic design, just besides the drawing, if they have been working with DPW? 
No, it's my understanding is DPW is going to uh, perform the work uh, and assist with the design of the project. They're trying to utilize existing pathways and, and access points on Boston Road for this construction so as not to alter or impact the impact on the abutters as well as the, uh, the, the impact on the, on the land that, is, that exists today. And one other question. Do you have any guarantee that it won't exceed this 30,000 um, because we have potential vernal pool? Um, I know the road, I can barely get my truck down, so doubling it's going to be expensive. Um, if there has to be a swale or a runoff um, in the parking lot, the material, I just see 30000 is real low compared if, to what it costs to build the other one, um, Sunny Meadow. If there's, a, if there's a need for further money, they may have to come back to future town, town meeting to, to make a request. Um, if not, I mean, we, we, you know, if it's a minor overage, we probably could cover it through the DPW operating budget, but we believe that the 30000 will cover the, the cost to complete this project. All right, uh, you can start the clock. Um, I looked at this plan, and what I'm not happy with is there's no plan. If you were to bring something before conservation or a town body, they'd expect to see a plan, a driveway, what your drainage is, um, what your runoff's going to be, and uh, I just think we should hold the town to the same level that they hold residents to. Present a decent plan, let it be reviewed, and then um, we'll look at it then. So I'm going to have to vote no on this just because there's no plan. And uh, I've said numerous times, whenever we purchase a piece of open space or we do plans, we need to know what's going in there, we need to have an idea of how much it's going to cost, and coming back over and over just to make the short gaps uh, doesn't make me happy. So I'm going to vote no on this. Thank you. Kathy Tuberty, Precinct 1. Um, has anybody asked the, that little house in the bottom right? Because it looks like it's at the end of their building is this driveway, and we're going to throw a chain link fence up there. Have we gotten any feedback from that? the owner of that facility, that home? I, and I understand the polygonal issue. <clears throat> We've had discussions with uh, that brown house that she's referring to is a condo. And I think there's four units in that building. And we've had discussions with the owners or the, the individual owners of the condo association and explained to them that there's a, going to be a, a driveway into the reservation at that point. Um, we have about 25 feet of space between their lot line and the lot line across from the driveway, which is owned by the Poles. When the property was sold off historically, the owners kept driveways to get to the main roads, but sold off the other lots for housing. It's our intention to put a fence between that brown house and the driveway. Uh, so that there'll be, and also to take a look at the signage at the entrance right at Boston Road, and also there's a, uh, there's a small uh, piece of retaining metal in front of that brown house and make sure that's positioned properly. Okay, so scooch, because you're not going to go far, I think. <laughs> um, chain link fence is cheap, I get, relatively speaking, but aesthetically it's horrific. So if, if the, if, 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 well, uh, speak, speak into the microphone. If, you, if you're standing what? on the other, other side, it doesn't work as well. Okay. So, well, I stand. No, uh, okay. So, so the, the question is, is again, and I, I actually agree with Phil that the dollars might be a little bit low, um, but is there a way that we can be aesthetically not as offensive by putting the chain link fins in? And then how is that plus the driveway work plus the signage, crosswalk, caution lights, all going to happen within that $30,000? I think that was a good, good question from Phil. We've asked DPW to answer that question for us. And it won't, and obviously that, that driveway will be constructed to meet whatever standards the town has for driveways and roads and signage. Um, whether or not it's a chain link fence or something else, is a decision that will be made with the input from the homeowner. Uh, it's our feeling that as, as unattractive as a chain link fence might be, we can find perhaps an appropriate design that's better than a split rail fence or a stockade fence. Um, 
but we'll work that, that issue out. Um, as I said, it's 25 feet wide. Driveway doesn't, driveway has to be about 18 to 20 feet, so. Sue Carter, Precinct 5, also a member of the Board of Directors for the Chelmsford Land Conservation Trust. Um, a couple of points here. Every other time we've had a project, we've seen a plan. You know, Dave's saying the existing driveway is so 15 to 20 feet wide. We don't have a real plan to see what the real impacts are. We don't even know exactly how many parking spaces we're getting out of this particular parking lot. Um, on the land trust, the current version of the conservation restriction said 15 parking spaces. So I just feel that it's premature to come to town meeting for the money when the planning hasn't even been completed. Um, at, the land, at our board of directors meeting on Tuesday night, this perimeter survey hadn't even been completed yet. So we don't really know where all the lot lines are. So um, I look back to see what we did when we created the parking lot for Sunny Meadow. That was a fully engineered plan. They had drainage, they had everything. Um, later on in town meeting, we're gonna be adopt, we're being asked to adopt stormwater standards. Well, that applies to this too. The town isn't exempt from these regulations. Um, and because of that, I agree with Phil. I think this is premature and I'd encourage people to vote no. Thank you. Thank you. Will Wagner, Precinct 8. Um, I, I just want to uh, agree with uh, the previous speakers. Uh, every other project has required a plan. Um, I might have had disagreements with how Friendship Park was brought to town meeting, but they had a detailed plan of what they were planning to do. Uh, the dog park, although it didn't take money from the town, uh, had a 15-page uh, engineering plan of what was going to be laid out. Um, this is a mock-up in PowerPoint, and I don't think it's sufficient. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. So let's vote on Article 27. $30,000 of com Community Preservation Fund General Reserve for parking area at the Warren Pole, Pole Conservation Land. The article fails, 39 in favor, 87 opposed, two abstentions. Article 28. Are we passing over to 28? No, 29 was. Right. Yeah, Article 28 was the petition article which, which you announced would take up at the beginning of the... Oh, oh, I'm session. sorry, you're right. That's my, my bad. Okay. Because uh, that was Mr. Kosicki's petition, citizen petition right, article. Right, right. Um, so the next article, if you move through the handout, uh, it, you go beyond 29 and 30, where we already did in the consent agenda, so now we're at 31, the stormwater management bylaw. And I'm going to turn the presentation over to Christine Papadopoulos, the town engineer. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Oh, so I have. So why do we need a new bylaw? The EPA, Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System, the MS4, uh, permit, this allows the town to discharge stormwater to the waters of the U.S. This MS4 permit requires the permittees, which is the town, uh, that we, we must update the regulatory mechanisms by June 30th of this year, per the MS4 guidelines in 2016. This bylaw encompasses all of the recommendations made by the consultants, Weston and Sampson, through our stormwater master plan review and tie and bond through the Northern Middlesex Council of Governments grant. 
that we were that were hired to review our existing regulations for compliance with MS4 requirements. Having a concise set of stormwater bylaws in one place will help everyone navigate permitting and alleviate confusion. It helps clarify the roles and responsibilities of the stormwater authority and associated regulatory requirements. The town of Chelmsford does not have any stormwater regulations for projects that are not covered by the planning board, conservation commission, or zoning board of appeals process. So this helps to, to fill in those gaps. The EPA has expressed a preference to this model bylaw that allows municipality to revise the regulations as the requirements changed. We've had an opportunity to meet with EPA regarding um, the new bylaw requirements and um, this is one that they've mentioned as an, as an excellent um, template that was provided to us through the grants that we received um, in, in conjunction with the Northern Middlesex Council of Governments. Ty and Bond um, prepared this, um, the, the template. So what does this bylaw do? It requires stormwater management systems to be designed in compliance with the 2008 Massachusetts Stormwater Handbook. Uh, since both state and federal requirements are going to be changing soon, it's best to allow the DPW to modify the regulations as those federal and state requirements changed. So this will implement and enforce a program to reduce pollutants in stormwater runoff to the MS4 from land disturbance greater than or equal to one acre within the regulated area, which is the whole town of Chelmsford. It also allows an administrative land disturbance approval that will be reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis for projects that disturb over 20,000 square feet up to an acre. This would meet additional requirements for projects where stormwater discharges to an impaired waters, which are polluted waters, or waters subject to a total maximum daily load, which is a TMDL. That basically means they're polluted. Um, this would meet requirements for record keeping and annual reports, which are all required from EPA. It includes requirements for stormwater bylaws regarding post-construction stormwater treatment, which is another one of the requirements from EPA. This is a bunch of technical information, which, which is uh, exactly what it is that we need to uh, encourage within the new regulations. Essentially, it requires total phosphorus and total suspended solid reduction from post-construction stormwater runoff from new and redevelopment um, projects as defined in the permit. So how does everyone get affected by this? So I looked at all the different um, stakeholders and developers, essentially, um, it would help them by giving them one set of rules for stormwater. You would know exactly, they would know exactly where to go to look for the stormwater regulations. Um, so it alleviates confusion. Um, also, ultimately, it will um, remind them to uh, focus on improving water quality, which is important to all of us. Um, it also uh, uh, provides clear erosion control requirements. So looking at how it would affect the boards, because it's a new regulation. It, but it, it would allow DPW to review stormwater compliance with EPA and MS4 requirements. It allows local regulations to follow the EPA and Mass DEP revisions in the stormwater requirements. So no additional effort, the DPW will, will oversee the program. The DPW, um, we will be issuing the stormwater permits as necessary. We will continue to inspect sites. We will be reviewing plans for compliance with the state and federal requirements and the residents. Uh, so it encourages groundwater recharge, which ultimately helps with drinking water quality. That improves our, our quality of drinking water. Uh, it encourages low impact development, which improves aesthetics. Uh, it improves the water quality for us to continue to um, enjoy swimming and drinking and, and enjoying the, the water bays of, of Chelmsford. And it improves um, erosion control and uh, hopefully you'll see more construction site inspections. The repercussions, so if we don't pass the bylaw, the stormwater regulations remain antiquated, which they need to be revised because they're really old. Um, and also the town is not compliant with the EPA MS4 permit, which is um, really bad because then the town would get fined by EPA. So the next steps essentially are, it gets approved by the Attorney General. Um, and the neighboring towns have similar bylaws and will be required to modify their regulations to meet the same MS4 requirements as Chelmsford. Um, I've met with other neighboring towns and we're all sort of looking at the same, um, same sort of uh, bylaw um, setup. Uh, existing projects would be grandfathered until the next time they disturb an acre or more. So the DPW is ready to implement the bylaw and updates to our local regulations will happen uh, once the state revises their regulations. So hopefully fall town meeting, I'll be back 
presenting a bunch of different <laughs> uh, revisions to the regulations, so they're all meeting up with the same, the same regulations. Um, in general, it improves our water quality, encourages ground recharge, improving erosion control, and aquatic and wildlife habitat, which is very important for us to maintain. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Does the Finance Committee have a recommendation? The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 31. Does the Select Board have a recommendation? The Select Board unanimously recommends approval of Article 31. Hopefully nobody's going to ask me to read the whole article. <laughs> Any other comments? There being none, let's vote on uh, Article uh, 31. Article passes 120 in favor, two abstentions. It is now about uh, 1055. Um, you guys were awesome. I, I can't believe how much work we got done today. So uh, I entertain a motion to continue until at, at, uh, after the uh, special town meeting at 729. Second? All in favor? Thank you very much. Kelly Beatty from the floor of town meeting, and, and uh, I have to say we got a lot further with our warrant than I expected to. Uh, there are 42 articles on the warrant, three were withdrawn, uh, 12 more handled in a consent agenda, and we got through 32 out of 42. So 10 are left, but they are pithy. Uh, they involve a, uh, a uh, uh, statement on, on climate change, or at least the setup of a committee to do that. Uh, grist mill issues uh, with our sewer system, and uh, perhaps most importantly, there will be a series of articles at the end of the warrant having to do with uh, the advent of marijuana, its uh, recreational use, its sales here in town, and, the, and the, the changing of our bylaws to accommodate all of that. Plus, there will be a special town meeting for articles on that warrant that did make it in time for the regular town meeting warrant. And for those of you who have uh, used Stedman Street, and I suspect that's pretty much all of you, you will finally know for certain how it is spelled. And so uh, this is Kelly Beatty thanking you all for joining us this evening. Just want to mention I am wearing my official Chelmsford tie from Chelmsford, England. And uh, you can ask me about that down the road. For our staff and volunteers here at Chelmsford Telemedia, I want to thank you for joining us. We'll see you Monday night.